Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, this is a presentation and an overview of what is sex by Alenka Zupancic. And um, it's also a preview of a course which is being co-led by both myself and uh, David McCarricker of Theory Underground. He'll, he's with me here today. And um, it, it's really here a preview of um, a course which starts May 7th. Uh, which is, an, again, a collaborative attempt uh, between Dave and I and, and Philosophy Portal and Theory Underground. Philosophy Portal has been offering uh, courses in philosophy for a year and a half now, and sort of the main focus of Philosophy Portal is to offer a window into foundational texts of, of uh, modern philosophy. And uh, you know, we've done courses on Nietzsche, Hegel, um, Freud. Um, and this little mini course on Alenka Zupancic as part of the Slovenian school is a little bit of a, a, a stylistic switch up, but it's, it, it's bringing our focus more to contemporary philosophy. Um, and I'm really excited here to collaborate with Dave. Dave, did you want to uh, introduce yourself and, and Theory Underground? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much for having me on. And it's great to see so many people here on the side of the live chat. So hello to the people who are here now, as well as in the future, who will be joining through Philosophy Portal, through YouTube, as well as through the Theory Underground course that is on offer for this, because we're both offering this course on our respective websites. Theory Underground is, in short, a course-based social media and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. So there's an app on the way that has like this sort of social media side. Mikey, one of my collaborators keeps calling it the first Facebook for theory. I think that that's not quite right because Mark Zuckerberg is not so involved and I'm very involved. And so it's, you know, it is my thing, but you know, it does have that aspect for kind of the online community component, but something that Cadell and I have in common that I really appreciate the philosophy portal is doing is the desire and effort to make these things happen in real life, right? So I, uh, we're, we're, I'm doing a tour this fall with my fiance, soon to be wife. Um, we're going to be uh, promoting Underground Theory Volume One, as well as a couple of our first books and connecting with the people on the site. So if that sounds fun, get involved. And I look forward to collaborating with Cadell on real life events in the future. All right. Like I said, before we went live, check out Theory Underground's YouTube channel and website if you haven't yet. And I'll leave links in the description to those of you watching on YouTube um, to both those uh, both those resources. But um, now our focus for today is going to be on what is sex. Again, this is going to be a dive into the introduction. The introduction and the conclusion are both relatively short, and I think they lend themselves to um, to, to just a, a quick overview. And I think it, it will give you also a sense of the style of the course itself. You know, Dave and I are experimenting a little bit. I've also, for anyone who's been following Philosophy Portal, you know, I've, you know, comfortable giving presentations and stuff like that, engaging in Q&A, but we're doing a little bit of an experiment here to see insofar as we can do presentation slash conversation at the same time and maybe bring something out of the text, which otherwise can't be done with just one person. All right, so let's let's start off with a little bit of a background on Alenka. Um, she's been you know, uh, involved in theory now for well over two decades. Um, and, and what really holds her work together is a combination of Lacanian psychoanalysis and continental philosophy. If I could say really one thing that holds her work together in my view is basically her philosophical interest in Lacan's return to Freud. And I think that this, it, this in, it, in and of itself is a type of um, short circuit, if you like, which will come up as a common sort of concept throughout what is sex. The reason why it's a short circuit, and we'll get into it a little bit, is that oftentimes there's a divide between Lacanian analysts who, um, I guess, don't see the universal relevance or importance of philosophy anymore, perhaps a deconstructive lens of philosophy. And on the other hand, you could have contemporary philosophers who see psychoanalysis as a very particular um, clinical um, field, uh, which doesn't have universal, uh, which has no universal 
um, uh, importance, let's say, to um, philosophy. And I think Alenka here operates as a short circuit here. And, and her work, you know, especially ethics of the real, why psychoanalysis, you know, and others um, bring that short circuit to the surface. Do you want to want to jump in here, Dave, and and give your? Oh, just that I would just say Slavoj Žižek wrote uh, a forward to the whole series on the the short circuit, right? And it's at the beginning of what is sex, and definitely yeah. worth reading and rereading and thinking about because what what they strive to do is to take what has been relegated to specialized fields of monopolized skill sets and knowledge. And sh short circuit these 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 competing or or so or isolated totally isolated not even competing fields um, by bringing them into dialogue around uh, relevant issues right and usually through psychoanalysis and, and and philosophy so but well said yeah I mean I I, I thought ethics of the real is perhaps you know one of her um, like well I guess it's her first major work. Is, is a particularly interesting insight into her sort of methodology in terms of what sort of held her career together and when she takes, you know, Kantian morality and she throws it up against the Lacanian real and tries to see in so far as Kantian morality and the Lacanian real can be thought together. It's a good example of taking universal philosophy and combining it with sort of, you know, a real that, that, that has been derived from clinical work um, and seeing insofar as they can um, produce new uh, way of thinking about ethics in that in that case. Um, mm -hmm. And, and in, 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 in the same way, I think with what is sex, I mean, sexuality, as we'll get into, is not a topic which many philosophers have approached. Um, there are a handful, but it's, it's often something that is itself repressed in philosophy and is seen as, again, something which is anthropomorphizing, something which is bringing it too, too personal, too particular into philosophy. And Alenka here um, is also offering a short circuit in that regard. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll go on to, this is something that Dave and I, I'm just gonna point towards this because if you wanna go into these three reasons of why read what is sex, I'm gonna point you and I'm gonna link in the description to those of you watching on YouTube after, to a discussion which Dave and I had on these three reasons. You have sex and the things in themselves. You have deontological epistemology and you have paradoxes of free sexuality. And we unpack these three reasons throughout a long conversation about, you know, not just reading what is sex for its own sake in some sense, but, you know, these are three um, aspects or concrete dimensions of, I think, our contemporary intellectual and embodied lives, um, which, really require uh, us to give an intellectual attention to this topic that, that Alenka has dedicated an entire book to. When we think about things in themselves or the ultimate reality, um, the fundamental reality, oftentimes this is not thought of as in any relationship to sexuality. And yet, isn't it weird how our libidinal universe, our libidinal attachments are at the same time so uh, fundamental for us, so constitutive of the way in which we build our life worlds and the way in which we uh, organize our time. And when it comes to deontological epistemology, it's simply trying to think the relationship between knowledge and the things in themselves, or knowledge and reality, or knowledge and being, however you want to think about this. And, you know, uh, Alenka will say that sex is the short circuit of both, right? It's the short circuit of epistemology and ontology. And so she's trying to think in the gap or in the cut of epistemology and ontology. And when we, you know, a lot's at stake here, because when we just have a view, which is the gender constructivist view, like we can just construct whatever gender we like, and it's not having any relationship to the real, has no relationship to ontology, then I think that we can fall into a very naive relationship to sexuality, where we actually uh, debase it and de and, and sort of, you know, de-emphasize it, it, its importance in our life and the way in which it limits or constrains our construction, right? We are not just you know, constructing in the void, we can do whatever we want. Uh, sexuality here offers constraints, limits, things which are uh, of an even effectively disturbing dimension. When it comes to both Foucault and Butler, as I give an example there in the second point, Alenka's approach to both of them is kind of similar where she's saying, 
both Foucault and Butler try to see the positive power in construction without seeing the disorienting negativity of sexuality, which she tries to bring to the forefront. Um, Chita, and I, I think there's some line that you put on the screen, I, or I'm not sure how that's happening. Um, there's a green line on the screen now. But, um, uh, yes, and then, yes. fin then finally with paradoxes of free sexuality, um, basically, I think this is a huge political problem, which is that when we have a society which is not willing to think through sexuality, um, we uh, actually don't, or when we just see sexuality as a positive force, you know, like sex positivity, or just see it as an affirmation, just see it as an open construction. Um, this actually leads to a situation where uh, the opposite is true, is where we get uh, overwhelmed, our identities become overwhelmed with anxiety where our society actually becomes less social, where we, we fall into isolationism, and also where we become susceptible to, um, where we become susceptible to, I think, traditional returns or fascist or conservative returns or views of sexuality, just simply not in any way, um, not in a sort of, um, you know, not, not in, a, in an overly negative way, but just as um, a fact that, people don't know how to uh, think the categories or think the constraints um, or how to build you know, a, a, a life with, with in the modern sexual landscape. And so they just see tradition, many people will see conservative, traditional or orthodox views on sexuality as simply helping them deal with that anxiety. You know, so I think these are some of the things in the background that I, I think we should be thinking about as we go into the text. Dave, did you wanna, did you wanna jump in there? Should I move on? Yeah, no, I want to say a couple of things just to kind of like where the rubber meets the road for for where I think we're coming from at the theory underground is that there has been a schism between theorizing what is real and how we know what is real and that with the analytic school of philosophy that is so dominant in the United States. Uh, and I come from an analytic department from my undergrad, not that that doesn't make me some kind of an expert. It just means I have some strong feelings, really, because, you know, it's my undergrad. But I, I definitely decided that wasn't where I was feeling called in philosophy, um, because it, it's kind of like logic crunching for the sake of logic crunching. You know, uh, they call it conceptual analysis. Um, they call it. Um, hold on, I think. Cheaten, um, can we uh, can we mute? I think it's it's uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, so analytic philosophy is not worthless. I always like to say it. It definitely contributes valuable things, but they had a huge focus on epistemology in the 20th century, which was like, oh, how do we know? How do we know things? How do we know things? And the issue with that is, if you're interested in social theory, and if you're interested in power analysis and critique and, and everything like that, th that stuff gets bracketed out of the equation almost all the time. A lot of the analytic philosophers were socially progressive. They just kind of assumed the values of academia at the time, of progressive circles at the time, but they didn't feel that those needed to be justified. They didn't feel that they, that, that we, they, they didn't feel the need to develop a theory of social change, right? much less like a theory of how do we uh, reconcile conflicts and contradictions between competing value frameworks in a pluralistic world, not mm -hmm. on the radar, not on the radar. Yeah. And so, you know, that's important. And uh, so that's, that's my thing on the, the first point. Uh, she, she brings up though, that there's this ontological turn with the, and she's not just talking about the analytic philosophers, who became a little bit more open to metaphysics, theorizing what is real as opposed to just how do we know? And the I, th I think later in the book, she's going to take on object-oriented ontology, yes. as well as some of these other veins in philosophy today that have become like, oh, you know what? We need to get back to thinking about objects. We need to get back to thinking about what is real um, and, and, and kind of get out of our epistemological rut. And she's saying, both both camps mm. have 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 lost something here, and and uh, a lot of people think they can just kind of skip uh, a lot of the work that's been done in the last 
150 years in the in theory. And the one thing that we can appreciate about the, the Slovenians the most is their rejection of this idea of skipping phases of philosophy. They are committed to doing the work. And so that's something I appreciate, appreciate about them. Then the other point was just to kind of say, there will be a sort of ongoing discussion. You definitely go check out our previous conversation from last week on my channel about it. But how does gender activism and advocacy and sex um, take a, a kind of unfold in today's hyper polarized and very superficial theatrical uh, culture war? And the you know, and it basically it's the difference between trans and trads. Right, trads being traditionalists, uh, trad wives, and and uh, orthodox chads. Um, on uh, that, that's the one sort of side, and then the other side would be the uh, identity is what you make it. Uh, it's what you tell other people you are. End of story. Pure affirmation. Turn your brain off. Not along. And most people aren't really satisfied with either of these, and for good reason. And. So I, yeah, th that is my, sorry, I'm hearing myself. Yeah, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, someone came into the chat. I think there's a, I'm going to mute them. Yeah. All, all good. All good. Cool. Anyway. So yeah, that's for me, I think two of the, the, the very important things here. I mean, you basically already said it, but I kind of wanted to put it in my own terms just to bring into relation with the stuff that we're doing. So yeah, I no, it's covered it's, it. Yeah, no, it's it's super important. And I think like it, it brings it to something which is very relatable for everyone in terms of the social dynamics of today. I think many people can relate to this kind of ridiculous binary that that I think is emerging between on the one hand, you know, the extreme religiosity and on the other hand, I guess the extreme religiosity of of maybe you call it woke. But there's there's the fundamentalist traditionalism, the trads and the trans, like you said. And I think that, mm -hmm. that hopefully we can think through this binary. I, I, I think the big problem is we don't have a language that helps us articulate a way out of this binary. And I think it's very easy no. as soon as we you're right. And I think as soon as we put it into language, um, we can fall on one side or the other. And I think that's 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 incredibly problematic. But anyway, that's in the background. This is these are kind of some of the both philosophical and practical real world reasons why Dave and I think this text is worth um, our time and attention. All right. So, yeah. So going to philosophy analyzed for a sec. Uh, just whenever someone comes in, I've got to mute them. That's OK. Okay. It's great that we have a, a lot of people in here, though. So that's that's fantastic. So philosophy analyzed. This is this is a point which, um, and also I'm not sure how we can get that green mark off the screen. <laughs> it's whoever, apparently now. Whoever, anyway, whoever, whoever in the chat, please uh, think. Maybe you did it. Just everyone in the chat, think. Did I do it? And if you think that you might have drawn the line, try to think <laughs> about how. Try to think about how to undraw the line because. Otherwise, we'll just make our joke that this is the cut of the reel and roll yeah, with it. Yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw it was chit, at least when I came on my screen, it said chitin. But anyway, if if it's there, it's there. In any case, um, it's it's okay, chitin. Don't worry about it. Okay, so um, here philosophy analyzed. Um, when we think about. A crucial point that the Alenka, Alenka brings up um, early in the text, and is kind of like an opening point that she makes, is kind of situated in this um, relationship between philosophy and psychoanalysis. And specifically, she makes a point that philosophy for philosophy in the 20th century became reduced to a type of postmodern deconstruction, where um, tr specifically in relationship to itself, sort of the self-reference of philosophy, is that all the concepts of philosophical history, we could think about Plato's The One, we could think about Kant's Antinomies of Reason, we could think about Heidegger's Question of Being, that things in philosophy were seen as sort of in need of deconstruction, uh, that all of the concepts were related to a function of power, ideological state apparatus, um, that, that philosophy needed to reinvent itself um, and needed basically to throw away all the old concepts and come up with new concepts. Now, philosophy for psychoanalysis 
Um, and this is a point that Alenka makes, and I'm going to give a, a specific quote which reflects this in a bit or after this slide, is that the conceptual heritage we receive from, from, from philosophy, we don't need to throw it away. We don't necessarily even need to deconstruct it. But rather, and this is what Alenka tries to do throughout What is Sex, is rather seize the way in which important philosophical concepts are actually reflecting a certain structural antagonism or deadlock inherent to sexuality. So like when we think about Plato's concept of the one or the idea, when we think about Kant's antinomies of reason, when we think about Heidegger's question of being, these are just examples. Um, you could do this with any philosopher. You could do this with Kierkegaard. You could do this with Hegel. You could do this with Spinoza. You could do this with, you know, fill in the blank. That the question here is, to what extent is the unconscious, which of course in Lacanian, Freudo-Lacanian uh, analysis is intelligent, is something which thinks and speaks. To what point is the actual emergence of certain philosophical concepts, a reflection of the intelligence of this unconscious. And so what I see in the Slovenian school, which is so powerful, is a road out of deconstruction. They're not deconstructed. In fact, when Slavoj Žižek opens up less than nothing, he says that what we're aiming for is something undeconstructable. And that's the dimension of the unconscious when we think about drive. When we think about drive, you know, Zizek will often emphasize that drive is not deconstructible. Drive is almost this silent repetition, which just continues to move, epercy, moave, it keeps moving. And in what sense, when we bring uh, both psychoanalysis to philosophy and we, when we bring philosophy to psychoanalysis, in what way can we think through important concepts in the field of philosophy from that point of view? That's certainly something that Alenka will bring up. Um, Dave, did you want to did you want to jump in here? Yeah, so I think one you know, my role, everybody, is is being the person who's sitting here who five years ago would have had very very little idea of of what's going on and and keeping those ears fresh, you know. And and basically, I think the big thing is that we should probably um, drill into uh, drive just a little bit because I think that's for me the most powerful contribution from the Slovenian school uh, and an intervention into my life because I had studied philosophy for like seven years before I started even trying to think about uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis. And I, Lacan is keen on the fact that Freud, Freud in the United States had been notoriously bastardized in terrible translations that conflated instinct and drive. And so, I mean, this is there in the early seminars. And I know that thanks to Nick and Andrew who are here in the chat right now. What's up, guys? I see you there, Nick. I like your background, by the way. But um, it basically drive, though, is one of those things that it takes a while to really start seeing it in reality, because fish don't think about or see water, right? In the mm -hmm. same way that we we're we're always in drive or in, in relation to it at least. Um, and so, yeah, would you, maybe we should each say a few things about, about drive. How would you wanna start off with that? Well, I think one of the interesting things to think about drive is perhaps its relationship to repetition. Um, when we like, so like for example, um, in both Zizek's work and Zupancic's work, drive is seen as something which in some sense is trying to, in some ways, sublate Deleuze's concept of difference and repetition a little bit, like where where you see those two opposites in 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 this in the same thing. But it's it's really this um, motion of the unconscious, and and thinking this motion of the unconscious, something which is is. Here's the here. I'll say one one thing which I think is crucial, and then pass it to you. Is that. There's something deep in desire. There's something deep as related to the ego and its ideals, which almost wants to bring things to a stop, which almost wants to bring things to a, a frozen picture, right? Like I think Plato's idea of the one here is, you know, the idea of this par excellence. It's the idea of the eternal forms. It's the idea of something which is not moving. 
you know, and I think that what the drive is, is this is, and yet it moves, is that no matter how bad the ego wants things to stop, no matter how bad the ego wants things to just <laughs> come to an end, it's actually what's revealed in drive is that that's a death drop, that actually you don't want to be alive, like <laughs> that you don't want to keep moving, you don't want to keep, as it were, breaking your cognition open um, and, and, and dealing with sort of like, let's like say- that. Anyway, I'll, I'll pass that to you, but that's, I think the, and I think that's a good example of connecting it to the history of, of philosophical ideas, because there's right. something, there's something in pre-psychoanalytic philosophy, which wants to find a place to stop or wants to find a place to rest. And one thing that people don't, uh, perhaps don't know is that Zizek originally wanted to call less than nothing or was debating whether or not to call less than nothing, eper si move which is, and yet it moves. And I, I see that as really capturing the essence of the idea of the drive. It's that which right. keeps moving. Right, right. And when I've heard people want to critique, you know, Zizek, very, very often the, the tendency is obviously the, the low hanging fruit of his political takes, but the, um, at the, you know, they'll go to like the level of, and I have a good friend who's doing this right now, like the level of dialectics, challenging him on his formulation of dialectics. Okay, cool. But if you've not really lived through Zizek and Lacan thinking about drive, you're not even in the conversation. So you can't really critique it until you've really allowed yourself to take on these drive glasses, basically. And you can't do that without jouissance. And jouissance... <laughs> Right, jouissance yeah. is the uh, untranslated. Uh, we, we usually don't translate it. Todd McGowan translates it as enjoyment. A lot of people do translate it as enjoyment, but that is. And though Todd is trying to not confuse people, I think it can be just as confusing because we conflate and we think of enjoyment as running down the beach, jumping up in ecstasy, going, "Yeah, this is great," or like you're, you're drinking alcohol and you just have this feeling of like you know, fraternity with the whole world. And you're like, this is great. That's, that's joy, maybe. Yes. But jouissance is usually not something that is obviously um, pleasurable. In fact, it is in the phenomenological experience of it, it can be the opposite of what we usually consider as pleasure. And so what, when, when one person is really stressing out, say on road rage or budgeting, um, say, the, the binging shopping um, or gambling or binging in any other way, right? Hate watching certain kinds of content online. There are ways that we get our partial jouissance, which is to say the dramatic exhilaration and intensity that disrupts our equilibrium and our pleasurable homeostasis. So you yeah. gotta, to, to really think about the difference between these two things requires, I just say, heuristically think of jouissance as the opposite of pleasure. And so while we have this rational idea that we wanna be pleasure seeking animals and we're all told that every day, um, the fact is we also desire exhilaration and drama and destabilization of that, uh, that homeostasis. And so obviously when you've got someone coming into the clinic for psychoanalysis and they're just a stress ball and they are obsessively repeating things, Re repetition compulsion is destroying their lives and they think i'm a rational person i want this thing and i've rationalized the way that i am but also my life is falling apart why is it falling apart getting a person to come to their own realization their own self-exam their own examined life um as to like a relation with their drive a relation with the way that their drive has fixed into a circuit of partial jouissance throughout the day and week and month because it's not in any one moment it's it's always part of a, of a of a circuit of a chain in the month right what is it that you're repeating it's not just the thing that you think right the thing that is, you, that is obviously bothering you is not the only thing that's bothering you right that's why the unconscious is involved so like what you might fixate on is oh my god i keep spending money that I don't have, or, oh my God, I keep drinking when I said that I wasn't going to, or, oh, I, I just can't stop thinking about doing this one thing that I know is really going to undermine me. That's connected into a life world of habits. And it's not the only way you get your partial jouissance. And so drive is the monster, so to speak, behind 
all of these different ways of getting it. And they're all linked up in some way. And so I've gotten obviously most of this from Michael Downs in the free stuff that we've put out on Zizek and Lacan 101. And for me, it's just, it, it is the most, it, it does, you don't become free of it just because you become aware of it. No. Um, and in fact, you, you know, it gives you some relative um, distance from it for a moment here and there, but then it's like, you you go right back into it. And so, um, yeah, this is, this is, this not being theorized by epistemology or by metaphysics or yeah. traditional philosophy is what's at issue here. Yes. And, and I just want to, cause that was just such a, that was a brilliant overview there. I think that was really good. What, what will come up in what is sex. And I think this is a good technical window in a very simple way to these concepts is for Freud, pleasure was always a reduction of tension and jouissance or beyond the pleasure principle or the death drive, whatever concepts we want to put on these, this is, it, it's something which continues to intensify tension uh, as opposed to reducing tension. When we think about, and, and I think in our contemporary historical landscape, we have to think about the way in which not only are we in some sense slaves to our jouissance, slaves to our death drive, but the way in which contemporary techno-capitalism exploits our death drive. The way in which contemporary tech, like for example, if you're a binger, uh, you have 24 seven access to binge, right? Like you could just buy an app, you can binge, right? So in some sense, techno-capitalism just hooks right into our death drive. It hooks right in and tries to get us to, and this is why I was trying to connect drive to repetition because that repetition compulsion, that repetition mm -hmm, compulsion, which mm -hmm. just, you know, you, you can't not do it, right? Or it's what moves me. It's what, you know, I off, like I'm a binger. And when I'm binging on a, my favorite food, I always have this feeling like it's moving me, <laughs> you know, or it's, you know, it's like, it's true. Like, yeah. He, oh, I'm doing this thing again. And I'm not, I, I'm not, can't stop it. Or I, at least it's very difficult to stop it. Or, you know, you could put some repression onto it or something like that, but it's going to explode through. And so that's, that's, that's what we're talking about when we think about drive. Let me here just give a quote from Alenka on this point of philosophy and psychoanalysis, which I think is powerful. At the moment when philosophy itself was just about ready to abandon some of its classical notions as belonging to its own metaphysical past, from which it was eager to escape, along came Lacan and taught us an invaluable lesson. It is not these notions themselves that are problematic. What is problematic in some ways of doing philosophy is the disavowal or effacement of the inherent contradiction or antagonism they all imply and are a part of. That is why by simply abandoning these notions, we are abandoning the battlefield rather than retain or win any significant battles. So the crucial thing here is Alenka is basically saying we should engage the conceptual battlefield of philosophy. We should see the way in which the history of concepts in philosophy are actually not something that we just need to abandon, but rather sort of see the way in which they're participating in a certain contradiction or antagonism. Again, Plato's idea of the one here is like the, you know, the idea par excellence, the eternal perfect forms. In what way is that notion a sort of response to a deadlock? In what way is that idea a response to a certain difficult movement, like we were just talking about, the death drop? Right. And the same thing with Kant's antinomies of reason. And I could give other examples then, but this is just Alenka is inviting us to think about philosophy in this way, as opposed to simply deconstructing it. Did you want to say anything on that point there, Dave? All good. I'll move on. Okay. So, so in regards to uh, psychoanalyzing philosophy, you know, this is just sort of uh, an example of, you know, oftentimes we see philosophy and the unconscious as opposites, but actually Alenka invites us to see the overlap. Alenka invites us to see where the connection is. When we think about philosophy, we often think about it as the paradigm or the height of intelligent thinking and conceptualization. And psychoanalysis invites us to think about the unconscious, not as wild animal instincts, but as intelligent. You know, it's almost like she's asking us to think about the way in which the unconscious is always already a philosopher, you know, and, and, and I think that's really interesting when we think about underground theory, or it's really interesting when we think about, you know, bringing philosophy to 
you know, a wider audience outside of just traditional academia is that actually material for philosophy is everywhere. You know, like material for philosophy is, is already alive and well in, in our society. It's, it's merely sort of bringing uh, uh, us to the awareness of the way in which our unconscious is actually already uh, intelligent, thinking, speaking all the time. You know, it's, it's an interesting way to, to view the situation. Then um, as it relates to philosophy, it's often always thought about as the, the midwife of the concept or the creation of concepts, that this is what the role of the philosopher is. And for psychoanalysis, um, it, you know, it, it, it thinks about the unconscious as something that speaks and thinks. In other words, uh, psychoanalysis thinks about the unconscious as itself formulating concepts. So what is the relationship between the traditional philosopher who's creating new concepts, birthing new concepts, and the unconscious? I mean, oftentimes in analysis, you know, the whole point of analysis is to stumble upon the right concept, to stumble upon the right word that will help you deal with a certain neurosis or will help you deal with a certain, you know, psychological symptom. And then finally, uh, philosophy is often grounded under the law of non-contradiction. That is the law of identity. That uh, the point of philosophy is to make identities intelligible. Um, and uh, what you know, in, in 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 psychoanalysis, the unconscious knows no no. It's an affirmative contradiction. So in some sense, the unconscious is a site of non-identity. Um, the unconscious is a site which sees identity as contradictory and and but or that i doesn't see identity as contradictory as a problem right it affirms the contradiction right so like in a dream like the archetypal example would be in a dream the unconscious will present a scene or present a, a situation which is impossible but the unconscious doesn't recognize it as impossible it doesn't see it as a contradiction. It's, it, it simply expresses the contradiction. So in what sense, when we bring in the unconscious, in what sense do we break the traditional law of non-contradiction that we think of in, in philosophy? You want to jump in there, Dave? Yeah, and uh, just a quick sort of point of order, um, I because we, we hadn't really uh, fleshed out our strategy for this, but um, instead of calling on me, like, are you, do you want to say something? Sure. I, I'm sorry, I was muted. Well, we're just I'll experimenting just, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just start raising my hand because I think that's probably easier. But, okay. um, you know, but but never never as an interjection, always for whenever you're kind of done, you know? Gotcha. Because, um, yeah, it's all an experiment. But basically, I was thinking about uh, Socrates and the idea of the examined life is not worth living. And why does he say that? He says that because he's on trial for having challenged the norms, assumptions, idols of a society. And people were like, this is no good. You're corrupting the youth. And so obviously it's not just you're corrupting the youth. You're also making certain people who are specialists who are supposed to know what they're talking about realize in front of other people, they don't really know what they're talking about. And that is something that philosophers are not very well liked um, for a lot of the time. And uh, with that, Marilyn in the chat had said, Plato critiques the one of Parmenides in Parmenides' dialogue and draws out the contradictions. And I want to say, in this way of challenging the law of non-contradiction, what we do is, what we can say is that Socrates shows us that the examined life is impossible to live by oneself. He refused exile. He refused to go live in some other place. He could have escaped from jail. His friends were like, we can get you out of here, man. We'll take you. And he's like, no, no, I'm going to drink the hemlock because if the laws say that I need to die, then I'm going to make everyone live with that. It's a form of civil disobedience in a sense. If, if you all want me around, you're going to have to change the laws. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I've, I've refused to run away. And it's because the examine life requires that you live in the society that you've internalized. It requires that you be with others. And I think the, the Lacanian way to say this is that the self is extimate. That the law of identity, it, we, we have this idea, especially because of individualism today, that, oh, you know, the, the solitary thinker figuring out what is real, who am I? You know, no, no, no. The, 
the the self relies on the other and it and, and it is informed by the other and has internalized the other in all kinds of complicated and sophisticated ways that Lacanian theory will develop, especially if you take the Accre course with Cadell this uh, starting this July. Um, the point is, is that this law of contradiction, which is like the law of logic itself, when applied to the self, we assume I am I, you are you, me, you know, this, this uh, Dave is Dave, Cadell is Cadell, Marilyn is Marilyn. And what psychoanalysis shows us, as well as, you know, things like Hegel or thinkers like Hegel would be, no, the, y- there is no self-standing monad, monad, type of individualism that could, as a Cartesian subject, figure out who I am and live the exam in life in isolation, looking at a candle. It's not going to work. You can't be a hermit and really come into a true relation with yourself if you stay out there forever, if you really did forget your society. And so, yeah, we require others. We require the interventions from others. We, we, We require the sort of Socratic archetype to intervene on our smooth functioning, ideological, normalized world, because there's a lot of shit that we take for granted that we would never be able to see if we weren't coming into contradiction with other viewpoints and then through dialogue and reflection and more reading and writing, coming into a more fully formed concept of reality itself. So yeah, thank you. All right, yeah, and and then you're just gonna see Dave and I here just experimenting with style and, and just trying to figure out um, uh, what, what we're doing as we go. And, and, and so it, this, this also gives you a, a window into sort of, you know, um, you know, our, you know, I guess how we're going to stumble upon teaching practices and, and, and how we're going to develop and, and, and also that. So that's, I think that's really good. So I'll just wait for you to raise your hand there. And also if you want to bring in stuff from the chat, that's, that's cool too. And then we can make it even more sort of trans individual. And of course we'll get into a Q and a after as well. All right, so here, bringing in Zizek's short circuit, he offers just a short passage in What is Sex There and just sort of giving you an example of where he sees this work in the context of a larger series called the short circuit series. And here he's introducing basically the idea that the short circuit is a productive disruption into university discourse from the point of view of a critical mind, but um, from, let's say, uh, a university discourse perspective, it, it disorients the normative rules and the smooth functioning of the discourse. So he's seeing, basically what that means is he's seeing what is sex as disruptive from the point of view of the, the way we normally talk about sexuality or the way in which university discourse would try to explain or contain sexuality, that it is um, basically Alenka bringing the out of placeness of sexuality in regards to our normal intellectual conversations. And um, his first example of a short circuit is the way in which, for example, philosophy, religion, and politics were short circuited after a Marxist critique of political economy. So when we think about a short circuit, I mean, literally, uh, Marxist critique short circuited the world because it, in some sense, inter, in, you know, in, in, uh, introduced uh, the the disruption of the communist horizon itself. So now the communist horizon is basically fundamentally disrupting global, you know, political economic activity, creating tensions. And in some sense, we should see um, Alenka Zupanchich as introducing something of a similar order here. Um, Who knows what the long-term consequences of doing philosophy will be? Marx did not know the long-term consequences of his of his uh, of of his work, you know, and I think that that's one of the that's one of the intense and some of the, in some ways the terrifying thing about doing philosophy is that you don't know what what could be unleashed by actually thinking, and and Alenka here in trying to think sex is the same way, and um, here he gives a second example of ethics and morality after the inv- intervention of the Freudian libidinal economy, where it opens up the, the cracks and gaps of the unconscious mind and. If I could just here bring this into a sort of sublation, if I could, with the the two examples that Zizek is offering in his series is that both the Marxist critique and the Freudian critique as it relates to the disruption of of their respective fields, I think here could be situated into an interesting triad with Alenka's work, because with Alenka's work, it's almost like she's bringing 
and as she will, especially in the last chapter, bringing the Freudian unconscious to imminent political and economic problems. Right. And I think that that's where we get sort of uh, the combination in some sense of both the Marxist and the Freudian critique. Um, and, and there as this like sort of third short circuit in the in, in, in these two examples. I'll move on here to the status of sexuality. So in what is sex as a short circuit in the social sciences, humanities and natural sciences, what is being short circuited in some sense is this binary that we've already alluded to, but here we just give it the technical description is basically the binary between social construction and evolutionary reduction, right? On the one hand, you'll have people who are viewing sexuality as we can just construct our identities away from the traditional big other. On the other hand, you'll have people saying, no, sexuality is fundamentally evolutionary. It's something related to our organic foundation. And for Alenka, sexuality and specifically sexuality inherited from the Freudian tradition does not fit neatly into either category. Um, it doesn't fit neatly into social construction. It doesn't fit neatly into evolutionary reduction. You know, one of the reasons why on the evolutionary side is that sexuality, she sees it specifically in the human world as introducing a fundamental, almost an, an, an eternal uh, antagonism, um, not something which is simply reducible to an evolutionary past and becoming and change. It's something that we're always tarrying with. It's something that, and, and it's something that humans have been tarrying with from the beginning. And that's, I think, why in the conclusion to what is sex, she alludes to Adam and Eve and the story of Adam and Eve, not to identify in a in an orthodox or a traditional way with the story of Adam and Eve, but to introduce the way in which this, um, this eternal antagonism is, is reflected in our metaphysics. And that actually it's the location of, a, of, of profound metaphysics, that when you actually engage with the real of the sexual difference, you're engaging with profound metaphysics. Um, and, and in that sense, it's not simply reducible to social construction either, because social construction is often seen as, as, as the opposite of, of, of metaphysics. Um, that, that, and, and, and so just want to say that, that here, Alenka breaks this um, binary. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, this, uh, I want to say a thing about social constructivism, because uh, obviously, it's, you know, it, let's just make a quick, uh, what we mean by the evolutionary reductionism is that when a person acts a certain way or when a, a group of people acts a certain way, that's because of evolution, right? That's what the reduction is. You're reducing everything to the causal explanation of evolution. And uh, the way that you see this play out in the manosphere online with the uh, evolutionary psychology, especially through people like Jordan Peterson is you take what is st a, a, t a statistical norm and you say, okay, so on average, women are more likely to be like this. On average, men are more likely to be like this. And then you rationalize. Uh, then I'll, you rationalize I'll, I'll get it. Yeah. Thank you. Then you rationalize that um, by appeal to some kind of what sounds like a likely narrative from evolutionary past, usually by comparing us to you know other existing animals and there might be something to it other times there's definitely not right it, it, evolution can you can definitely be an armchair evolutionary psychologist who rationalizes anything and everything always it's always possible it's not falsifiable therefore it's not truly scientific um and it, it's a it's an emerging field it's worth taking seriously but at the same time it is a very easy tendency to just kind of make a bad appeal. On the other side is the social constructivist thing. And for me, when I think of social constructivism, I think the most ubiquitous thing to hear as a line of critique on the left today is, oh, well, that's just a social construct. And the point I think for, for, for what we're doing here is that yes, Everything cultural is a social construct, but it wasn't constructed by a bunch of people sitting around in a room and making a decision, usually, right? It, it's usually like people, humans, socially constructing patterns of behavior as ways of coping with fundamental human issues and contradictions, contradictions that arise because we are split by language, 
We have law, not instinct. We have prohibition and castration in, in psychoanalytic terms, which is really just to say we've internalized the no function. The dog, because it's domesticated, it de develops this sense for the no as well. You know, oh, don't eat that, right? But the, the your average creature on this planet lives instinctually. There is no language or law saying no, don't do this, and and then it's it has to do something to kind of redirect drive. It doesn't develop this complex relationship with drive that comes through being a languaged being, which is to say a split subject, and so. The, I think the most important thing, because I don't want to throw social constructivism out the out, out, out with evolutionary psychology, and obviously Cadell does not either, but if we're thinking about, you know, a, a living in a pluralistic society where there is a future on this planet, um, and we want to socially construct an alternative path than the one that we're currently seemingly on, then that can't just be what we want it to be. And that's, I think, the most important piece of the, like the, the un, unchecked assumption on the side of the social constructivists is because this thing that we don't like that is a norm has been national, uh, naturalized and rationalized normalized. by the normalized by the dominant discourse. Because of that, uh, we we discover, oh well, actually, it's not natural. So now we know it's socially constructed, which means it can be a different way. But then people assume, oh, but the way it can be different is the way that we want it to be different. And the point is. No, if you want to live in a pluralistic society, civilization, there you can't just have whatever you want. And it's not, and, and whatever you sit back in your armchair and go, this would work for me. First of all, it might not, but it also probably wouldn't work for most other people. And so there's you there's getting the democratic ideal of a bunch of rational actors getting together and making compromises and deciding a way forward. And the problem is, is those are all split subjects too. There's a bunch of shit we don't understand operating. And we've rationalized it in various ways as social constructivists or as evolutionary. But the point is, is we don't know a lot of the things going on beneath the surface. And so there is a, a, a I guess what I would say then is just that from the, from the standpoint of the social constructivist who wants to have a mature sort of plausible way forward, the point is, is that a lot of the things that have currently been articulated and structured in certain ways have a basis in these contradictions that aren't going to go away just because we want them to. Yeah, and, so and the thing, the thing is, is that I just want, I won't, I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but I just want to say the social construction. It seemed to me what, what's introduced with Alenka's work is the social constructions are not arbitrary. No, they're rather, they're rather responses to a, a certain ontological negativity marked by anxiety. So mm. they're, in some sense, the constructions are there for. There's a logic to the constructions. It's not just simply uh, oppression, like social oppression. And this is something right. that, that Zizek will make a, a point of often is that we should think not about, about social oppression, but that as sexuality as such is oppressive, <laughs> right? So in some sense, the situation is much darker. 100%. And that's, that's pretty much, that's it, that's perfect. I just, I guess the, the note of caution for social engineers, whether you wanna do it from bottom up or top down, Right. right. Whether you want to do it, whether you want to do it revolutionary or reformist, top down, bottom up, revolutionary reformist. These are the standard binaries and social change circles that split groups. I don't care whatever, however you configure it. The issue is always going to be you can't just take everything that is and throw it out the door and then start over from scratch like we're blank slates. It's not possible. So. And then like, where do you like in this sort of disorient, like the thing is, is like philosophy is, is good philosophy is interested in the truth. And even if that truth is a disturbing real. And so Alenka is going into this disturbing real and, you know, and, 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 you know, she's not providing any easy answers. What she's doing is, is she's trying to open up the field to a higher order discourse. And that's what yeah. I think Dave and I are trying also to bring out is a higher order discourse that we can't just go to these simple identities to solve, as it were, this uh, ontological dimension. And where I think we get the, let's say, some sort of certainty or some sort of orientation in the uncertainty, in the uh, disorientation, is the emotional challenge of anxiety 
You know, like I think it's pretty famous now that Zizek says anxiety is the only emotion that does not lie. You know, that, that, that anxiety in some sense reveals an important truth about your identity. And I think that that, at least for me, is what Alenka is trying to bring out in the ontological dimension of sexuality is that sexuality is not this, again, sex positivity, free liberating construction or natural self-symmetry. Like with evolutionary reduction, you have this idea of a natural self-symmetry. Like if I was born a male, that that correlates to my, me being a man, or if I'm born a female, that that correlates to being me and a woman. Not, it's not that simple. There's a deeper asymmetry at work between sex and gender. And so it's not just, you can't just collapse your identity back into the biological. That's the traditional move. That's the traditional move. But the thing is, right. is that it, right? So it's just that this, it, there's, and it's not saying you can't construct, it's not saying there's no symmetry, but it is saying that there is this challenging dimension of anxiety that when we construct or when we perform a certain gender, um, there is something about sexuality which is anxiety provoking negative. Um, and, 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 there's this, and at the same time, there's a great creative challenge because basically this, and I think Zizek always brings this up in his work as well, is that the death drive is fundamentally connected to sublimation, that there's something about abyssal sublimation and anxiety of identity, which is actually um, essential for us to think and work through um, in order to, I don't know what to, how to say it in a way that doesn't sound like gimmicky or like on a fridge magnet, but like to become our best selves, uh, to, to become our true selves. Like it's not really like necessarily just like that gimmicky, but there is something important about confronting the abyssal sublimation is what I want to say. There is something important there. Right. And I, I would just add an example of, uh, for, for anybody who's really not thought very deeply yet about the distinction between sex and gender, because I know a lot of people, once they see how absurd some of the naive progressivist tendencies can be, they just want to throw out this distinction as irrelevant. Well, if you want to throw out that distinction, it's actually going to create an issue for your traditionalist return or whatever, because there is in every society a distinction between boy and man and girl and woman. Okay, we could say male and, and female and we just stick to that. Male, female, and then we could talk about intersex people. No, 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 no. A girl is a female and a woman is a female. And so is a dog that is a female. So that doesn't really help very much beyond a strictly biological standpoint. The distinction between what makes a woman and what makes a man is not something that we can just throw out and if we look to every society that's ever existed, there's never, ever, ever been this idea that the boy gets to decide, now I am a man. It's always required rites of passage. And so, uh, and boys seem to require it more because women have a more naturally occurring, recurring, and obvious um, rite of passage, right? And so mm -hmm. that's, and that, that being the, the woman's, the, the, the girl's puberty is a lot more extreme in its obviousness being rooted but, to the, the cycles of nature, right? So, but now you have the puberty blockers. So now you, you've been, so now we're, so this, now we're bringing it to the level where um, there's huge political consequences for this conversation, right? Like we're having these conversations is like, when you take social constructivism to its extreme, where we're going is basically a non-dialectical approach to developmental maturation. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's, so it's not that, you know, because like, for example, like someone like Jordan Peterson might say, for example, that um, the, the pill was like the atomic bomb in our sexual landscape. And it's like this, you know, it's, when we have to approach these things dialectically, it's like, Technology is introducing basically new social situations in relationship to the mediation of sexuality. And the question is, how can we as mature adults make sure that the next generation is coming into a world where um, they are not being exploited by ideology constantly <laughs> or not being exploited by people who are using a certain extremist ideology to either reify their gender or stop their gender maturation from occurring at all? This is, this is part of, I would say, 
there is no more touchy subject today. Right. It's World War Three is less touchy than puberty blockers and double mastectomies for 14 year olds. So, you know, and, and the whole detransition, uh, you know, how many detransitioners, how many re people regretting does it take for it to matter to the advocacy uh, groups, right? It, it, like the, the surfs TV just tweeted the other day, well, it's only 5% people who have a regret rate when it comes to double mastectomies. And so these are saving lives. And so, you know, that's worthwhile. Okay, that is an argument that makes sense. This is not something that I wanna touch because it's so touchy. It's not something I really wanna touch um, until I have this basis with people, really. Like this kind of, a, this text and some related texts are prerequisites to really touch these. But to bring it back to the man, boy, girl, woman distinction, this will take a second, but I'm gonna read something. Um, so, uh, it's almost, uh, a meme now it's so common to see it in progressive circles where you know because you have like this as you said last week Dell, this uh sort of hyperbolic scapegoating the other side of the divide like yeah. oh it's men's fault oh it's women's fault both sides seem to be doing this thing where it's like oh well it's these women it's their fault well on the side that says it's men's fault there's been a statistic that they're running with these days and it says men are six times more likely to abandon their spouse who has a chronic illness. Hold on, I'm gonna read this. The, the, what the person was retweeting goes as follows. My husband threw a tantrum because I need surgery. So more bad news from doctor. I'll need a major surgeon soon or a major surgery soon. Estimated recovery time is approximately two months and I'll need bed rest for at least three weeks post-op. Told husband because we need, a pl need to plan childcare and whatnot. Did not expect him to throw the biggest tantrum the entire time I've ever known him. He kept saying he can't take care of me and shot down every idea I proposed, like hiring to help to handle the chores, etc. In the end, he was screaming, quote, it's ridiculous you, ridiculous you have no one but me, meaning I should have a close friend who will come and help on a daily basis for free. I don't. If a friend is helping, then I'm paying them because this is too big a favor to ask. My husband disagrees. In short, my husband can't care for me and doesn't want to pay someone to, even though we have the fund. I see he, I see he sees me as a complete burden now. So, let's, so the person retweets it saying, men are six times more likely to abandon their spouse who has a chronic illness. My, what I, what I, this was kind of a big realization for me. And so it, here it goes. The social statisticians, apparently think a guy who acts like this is a man. No culture, <laughs> no culture mm -hmm. in the history of the world that had any chance of existing in the future ever normalized this idea that that fucking boy, that little man child is a man, okay? And then people would say, oh, well now you're reifying traditional gender roles, aren't you? No, I'm not because as a society, we get to mediate this contradiction between boy and man. We get to have a conversation about what it actually means to be a man. But if you want to say it's up to the individual to self-identify and anyone, any petulant little Joffrey from Game of Thrones style person can mm. self-identify as a man, that creates a problem. You're not a man if you act this way. And that is not worth, uh, that is not worth letting go of. We can all individually bend gender however we choose, but there's also a socially, uh, a socially valid thing here. That is, if you let go of this, this kind of ideal of manhood is something that you can achieve, then little ragamuffin pieces of shit don't grow up because they don't have something to aspire towards. There's no socially objective, you know, it's not really objective, but socially valid form of accomplishing or achieving that thing. And so, I don't think social constructivists can let go of that so easily. And when they do, this is what happens. Statisticians get to say shit like this because they're confused. They fundamentally, they have a categorical error. Well, it's the question of, it's the question of values, right? Like, and, and that, that, that we do mediate sort of the, that, that men and women reflect certain valuation functions. They're like different value. Like what Alenka will emphasize is basically the sexual difference and that men and women are different responses to a certain failure or a certain negativity. But I think the question that's often left um, perhaps um, un, 
mediated is this question of of values, you know, and and I think you're bringing that up, and and hopefully that's a that's a that's a that's a question that we can continue to unpack and continue to mediate throughout the throughout the course. I think it's an important one. So here's a here's a quote from Alenka. The point that Lacanian psychoanalysis makes is paradoxical. The activity of speech is different than sexuality, but the satisfaction is the same. In other words, the point is not to explain the satisfaction in talking by referring to its sexual origin. The point is that the satisfaction in talking is itself sexual. And this is precisely what forces us to open the question to the very nature and status of sexuality in a radical way. So the question is here is, and what, what I think psychoanalysis brings is basically the very, our very process of speech, our very socialization is itself a sexual process. Um, it's a libidinal process. It's, in, it's invested with jouissance. It's invested with um, it's invested with, you could say, enjoyment, I suppose. But here you'll see in this quote is that she's quickly dismissing the evolutionary reductionist hypothesis. In other words, she's saying the point is not to explain satisfaction in talking by referring to its sexual origin. I'm going to give an example about this in the next slide, but rather satisfaction. And this is what we, we, this is, I think, the bomb. And I think she's saying, I think she knows this is the bomb as well, is that she's saying, the point is that satisfaction in talking is itself sexual. And I want to bring this also to a self-reflexive level between Dave and I, is that giving these presentations, you know, you know, even building the YouTube channels that we build, I mean, there's something libidinal about it. Like the, the, the satisfaction in talking, the satisfaction in giving these presentations or something like that is itself. And even, even co-sharing a presentation space, right? Like you and I co-sharing a presentation space, there is something like, where I feel like you encounter what's often the unconscious violence in language. Like if I cut you off or if you cut me off or, you know, where there's, there's something violent about it, you know, and, and, and actually like sharing a presentation space is actually not done very often. It's almost because of sharing phallic energy, right? Like, or sharing that, you know, sharing True. that dimension of speech, you know? So I think, that, that what Alenka really brings out is she forces us to think about our social space. She focuses us to think about our speech and where we socially construct as itself. The real of it is being marked by jouissance. The real of it is being marked by a certain sexual satisfaction, <laughs> which I think 100%. is important for us to reflect on. And I'm going to, we can go on, go into it a little bit more on this slide, but I was thinking like, when we're thinking about psychoanalyzing speech, when we're thinking about the enjoyment of language, like, do we ever think about a professor or a politician or do we ever think about podcasting and interviewing as sexual? We don't often, you know, but, or like music, like singing or rapping, like think about how popular rap music is today. Think about the jouissance in rapping, right? Like, so, just, or thinking about like watching Netflix, dramas and narratives. These are all, what I'm trying to say is these are all modes of libidinal enjoyment. And I think that what, what would be interesting to think throughout the course itself is the way in which the things we're normally engaging in our day-to-day -day life, watching a Netflix show, listening to a rap song, uh, maybe rapping or doing podcasts and interviews, or that politician giving a speech. Like these are all modes of libidinal enjoyment. These are all, like this is how we should be thinking about sexuality in a much more sublimated way than we normally think about it mm -hmm. yeah and i would yeah the the dynamic of like a interview lecture or of a co-lecture as a new form really mm -hmm. uh it it has this it, it really it, it ruptures the continuity and sort of it, you, you have a plan you're going to say a thing but there's this intervention and it's the real in that sense, right? You don't know what the other person is going to say. And the, you know, in a, in a well sterilized classroom where the professor has been teaching the same course for 20 years, it's like, yeah. okay, you, that person has a complete, they even know, uh, you know, a certain percentage of students on average are going to say X, Y, or Z things at that point, And they already know how to incorporate that and respond it, you know, and, and incorporate it all back into everything. Um, which is, which is a, a, they might not know those statistics or whatever logically or, you know, rationally, analytically, but they have it in their gut if they're a good lecturer. They have a sense for the kinds of things people will say because they've been at it for so long. And 
yeah. So anyway, you're good point. It really is. Uh, speaking, we're, we're, we're fucking right now. You know, according I was to just going to say this, this, we're going to upload this to YouTube, but we're also going to upload it to Pornhub. Right. So yeah. you know, no, I'm just, just <laughs> joking, but, but no, but like, I think on a, on a very, but on a very serious, on a very serious uh, note, like you, like w- when you're at university, you don't see professors giving joint presentations. Like if you're at a conference, you don't see people often doing a joint presentation or, 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 or learning how to hold that space with the other. Right. And yeah. I think like for, like for, you know, I'll just speak for me is like, I think that's really important. Like I remember when, when, um, when I was doing the book, sex, masculinity, and God, I was holding that space with two other guys and it was actually very intimate, right? It was both intellectual, but also very intimate. And you have to not just think about what you want to say theoretically, but also the style or the form of the way in which you're saying it with the other and when to give space for the other and how to keep your intellect in a dynamic with in that sense you i mean it's just like when you are having actual sex with your partner if you care about your other partner's enjoyment <clears throat> you're basically trying to to mediate jouissance for two or you're trying to mediate jouissance for for more and, and it's all about this relationship with the other and that's and i think that we should think about that more with, with all of these things these are just examples Right. Or the way in which it can be exploited and 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 um, uh, manipulated or 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 used as a weapon or a tool, you know, like we often don't think about the professor or the politician in that way either or 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 having a sort of I guess that's sort of the underlying dimension, even when we think about the politics of platforming someone. Right. Like the, the way in which you're violating certain jouissance or the way in which you are you know, disrupting the libidinal universe of a certain community by platforming a certain individual, right? We don't, we think about it in a very disembodied, we think about it in very abstract ways. We don't think about it in terms of you are violating someone's, um, you know, uh, mode of enjoyment or you're violating someone's sexual space. Like there are boundaries here which are being sexually transgressed. We're definitely short-circuiting our own sort of, uh, there's a there's a, a lot of things that we're ready to talk about, right? And we're short circuiting those. And I like it. I think that it's. I, I really really appreciate because I've been practicing this for a couple of years with Mikey, but th- we've not been using slides. I feel like using slides is like this whole other level, Cadell. That <laughs> I really think it's a great idea. And so you know, and, and you know, and the media, the the message. Uh, the medium is the message, right? For right. McLuhan, meaning that the the uh, having people in the live chat because they're a part of the course or because it's a free you know session for the course, or if it's live on YouTube or if it's a private call on Zoom, all of these change the, the dynamic. Yeah. Uh, in, in in subtle, not always so obvious ways, but that's one of the other things that we have to be thinking about if we want to be critical media theorists, and we do want to be critical media theorists if we want to live the examined life because we're saturated in media today. Absolutely. I mean, and, and, and there's also, it's, to me, it's, it's one of the funnest things about entering this theoretical space is like, you know, watching Netflix is never really the same, you know, like, or you, like you, 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 like you see, you see like, or even listening to your favorite album, it's not the same or listening to your favorite podcast because it, everything gets, everything gets colored by this new opportunity for potentially philosophical theorizing in a space where you don't usually like you don't when you think about Hegel or you think about Heidegger you don't think about you know them potentially getting information from watching a tv show or something like that or listening to their album but actually that's a huge opportunity for us today is actually bringing these worlds closer together and actually finding deep material in you know Game of Thrones like you already referenced Joffrey so you know these types of things there's this this tendency for critical analysis of film to focus on, oh, they said this or so-and-so was represented, which excluded so-and-so or this other message. And that props up this ism, this worldview that has these effects in the world. And therefore we can judge the film on the basis of whether it's good or bad on and how well it represents certain ideas or uh, how much it's uh, it's uh, guilty 
for for representing certain ideas. And this is like you can any any ten year old can do this, right? They can be taught the basics of their worldview by their parents, and then they can sit there and watch it, and they can just go, oh, well, that's that's this, oh, that's 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 that, that's patriarchy, that's the male gaze. There is this level, and to to think instead, what does watching this do for an audience? that is a mixture of working class, middle class, ruling class people who are all getting enjoyment from it. What is it doing for those humans at the level of their subjectivity? And what, it, what, what might be the, the different levels uh, of, of what it's doing for people within a class or within, within a class society, right? So that is like this, this whole new world that gets opened up by thinking about enjoyment and film. And obviously Slavoj has two documentaries where he talks about film and he's talking about yeah. ideology and drive and enjoyment. And it's, you know, wonderful. So. Absolutely. All right. So this, this is an example. These are just, these are things really, this slide is just to, you know, get you thinking, stimulating some, some thought about the way in which this view on sexuality changes the way we might think about our speech and sexuality in general and being with the other and so forth and so on. Sniff, sniff. Okay, so there's another interesting flip here. Now, it took me a long time to understand this Marxist idea of human anatomy contains the key to the anatomy of the ape. It's like, it really flips things on its head because obviously, I mean, I studied evolution and I studied, for example, primatology and you usually think about it the other way around. Um, so it took me a while to sort of do this little reversal, but basically what's being reversed here is evolutionary historicist logic and the logic of the signifier, where basically what it's, it's like we're, we're just carrying on that point that Alenka made in the last quote, where actually we're not thinking about sex containing the key to speech, but rather speech containing the key to sex. So it, that, that's the precise logic. So now, in, now what does that mean? What that means is, and think about this in very practical ways, is usually like people can, people think in such, people can, let me say this, people can think in such a way and perhaps more phallic enjoyment is responsible for this, is that we speak to get sex. So like, let's take an archetypical example of a guy who wants to get laid. You know, he approaches a girl, he's speaking to that sp specific person because he's hoping that at the end of the speech, there might be the possibilities for sex. Or you go on a date and you hope at the end of the date, you're going to get laid. But really what psychoanalysis is saying is the opposite. It's that speech contains the key to sex, that we actually enjoy speaking itself. Um, it's not the sex that we want. It's, it's that what we want is to keep the conversation going. What we want is to continue enjoying a certain discursive horizon or a certain discursive relationship with the other, that that's what keeps desire moving. So it's, it's really, you know, and I think that that's a powerful thing to internalize. And it, it's not something that, you know, you can just, you know, snap your fingers and understand it's something, it's an example. And I think psychoanalysis in general is, is like this is that to really internalize it, to really embody it, if we want to use that word, um, you know, you, ha you have to think with it for a while and think with it in the context of your actual speech, because it revolves a lot of self-reflection, right? And it, it revolves you becoming more and more reflexive about your speech and about how you are um, using your speech in the context of the other. So sort of connecting to the previous conversations we had and Dave brought up in regards to evolutionary psychology, um, oftentimes the evolutionist point of view can reduce our sexuality to, uh, sorry, can, re can reduce sexuality to um, the, our basic core motives and behavior that all of our motives and all of our behavior is about getting sex or something about natural selection, something about sexual selection is the cause of our motives, the cause of our behavior. But very practically, and I think this is very clear as well, that psychoanalysis inverts this. Psychoanalysis reveals that our motives and behaviors are really about unconscious speech and thinking. It's not about we just actually want to just get the sex. We're not just reduced to this function. What we want is, is what we want is basically to 
um, have a certain drive in language. We, we want to have a drive with our speech and we want our unconscious speech to be liberated, free. Um, uh, and, and perhaps that's that, perhaps that's revealed in art. Perhaps that's revealed in music. Perhaps that's revealed in movies is that we see the logic of the signifier as opposed to the logic of, a, of an evolutionary reduction. So I think this reversal, this type of logic, I, I know for me, and maybe it's maybe I'm biased because I came actually from my original studies in evolutionary anthropology, that maybe for me it was harder to get a, a grasp of this logic. But this is a very precise inversion um, of, of evolutionary logic. And I think it it really holds up well when you think through this in the context of intimate relationships in the context of friendships, in the context of community. Like if we're thinking about those three things, Dave, our intimate relationships, our friendships, and our community, what we want is not to fuck each other, <laughs> like in terms of biological sex. What we want is to keep the conversation going, to be a part of interesting dialogues, right? And, 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 and to facilitate those spaces to like, for example, like if we talk about like, you know, not just conferences, but like retreats or festivals or symposiums. Yeah. These are the spaces we want to create. And, and this is the quote unquote anatomical key to sexuality and psychoanalysis is the human anatomy contains the key to the anatomy of the ape, not vice versa. So that's, that's, that's an interesting inversion. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. I have a question about this because it, I'm, I'm glad you elaborated on this because I do find the that statement that the human anatomy explains the anatomy of the ape applied to language and sex. Like I found that very confusing. And so I, I really hope to be looking for it, thinking about it in my own speech and right throughout through intimate friend and communal kinds of uh, discourse over the next couple of months here. But one of the things that you said, we want to keep on talking. And I think you said something like, we want to, did you say something like, we want to say the things that, we're think, well, that we've been thinking about or that we've got going on inside of our head? Like we, we want to let that out. Is that what you so you said something kind of hinting at that or is that? It's like, think about like, look, at, so let's use the examples of the intimate relationship, the friendship or the community. Like yeah. if we're, if we're a part of a good, if we're like, quote unquote, in a good intimate partnership, if we're in a, if we have a good friend or if we're in a good community, so to speak, what's going on there is that we can be transparent even with our most intimate thoughts and our, our most intimate speech. We can feel held in those spaces. We don't need to close ourselves off. We don't need to hide everything about ourselves that we feel free to speak our mind. We feel free to, you know, express ourselves discursively. Um, and, and we feel like that space can, can hold that. And, and sometimes that obviously, that's not just a, a smooth frictionless situation. Like in, no. real, in real relationships, there's going to be, you know, uh, antagonisms. But right. the point, the point is, is that there's space for that unconscious speech. And what psychoanalysis is saying is that that's really what motivates us. That's what we really want. We don't want to just be reduced to a sexual object. We don't want to just be all of our speech is organized towards sex. We want that our speech itself is the thing, right? right? Like that okay. we're, we're actually like, like think about what we're doing right now. What we're doing right now is we're, we're holding a co-presentation. You know, I speak, you speak. We have, we develop a certain back and forth. Um, we try to figure out what the ethics is. What is the method by which we do that? And the point of even going through that, like why even bother doing this? Like why bring on the other person is because there's something which is positive, which is opened up by doing that. There's a higher order intellect, which opens up a trans individual intellect, which opens up, which is itself enjoyable, right? Where I'm not just like there, there is, and if you can, like it's, it's difficult to do and depends on the people, but if you can do that, there is a certain enjoyment, which is opened up, which you don't just get by yourself. Right. And so I, I guess this, I don't think this is tangential. I think this is very helpful, <clears throat> but it will seem tangential at first. I'll tie it back around. One of the things that Mikey has brought up, I don't know if he got this as an example from some other Lacanian 
or if it's just Mikey's example, because he's really good at examples, um, is when we're thinking about the unconscious and like, you know, we might think about slips, slips of the tongue or, you know, yeah. uh, you say one thing, but you meant your mother, right? <laughs> the, 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 the standard joke, right? Right. Well, then we might think of dreams and the thing that people tend to let go under the radar assumed and never really critically interrogated is daydreams because there's this ironic distance and plausible deniability and sort of infinite interpretive interpretive ability when it comes to dreams. And in fact, when you tell your dreams to most people, they go, oh, wow, that's interesting. They don't care. They don't, they couldn't care less. <laughs> but, if, but, if, but, if, but if someone walks up to you when you're daydreaming and says, what are you thinking about? 99% of the time, you're gonna find something to talk about that's not the thing that you were thinking about. Why is that? And so bringing that into this idea that we, we, we need speech with others and we need certain kinds of speech with others. I wanted to kind of draw that in with the, the daydream idea, which is to say, like, we have to think about the thoughts we have all day, every day, because we repeat, we repeat them habitually, we repeat, com compulsively repeat them throughout the day. Yeah. And then we have like these daydreams that we kind of just have like this uh, relationship of disavowal towards like, like, oh, it's just a silly daydream but you wouldn't tell someone about it. Why? Because it exposes something about you at a deeper level than almost anything that you can say in that moment when someone asks you what's on your mind. And so we need speech in the sense that we have all of these thoughts and we, we, we need to get them out. We, you know, psychoanalysis, part of the point is just to free associate. You got to get, you gotta just talk and talk Venting. and talk and talk. And it's a safe space to vent where yeah. it's not, it's not a standard intimate relationship, right? In Lacanian psychoanalysis, especially, this is not your buddy. It's right. not, it's not friends and it's not community. And I think it's interesting that in all three of those spheres of life today, people are very hesitant to say what they habitually think about and what's on their mind. And I think that there is, in that sense, a sort of genocide of voice occurring. Yes. Yeah. In a world where people are scared to speak. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I wanted to start thinking about uh, what are the things that I, that I repeatedly say and think about that are things that I should probably talk to other people about. And then who are the other kinds of people that I have conversations with and which of these sort of spheres do they potentially fulfill and which ones do I gravitate towards the most and which ones does that mean I'm neglecting and is that a need that I'm neglecting those kinds of questions are going to be formative for me in the next couple of months yeah I think the, the I mean these these are the types of things that hopefully um this course and a, and a presentation like this can can provoke and indeed there are some interesting paradoxes that you brought up there in regards to like the example of the daydream and and disclosing and revealing and concealing and all of these things which these are the types of things that 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 we want we want to work through indeed like psychoanalysis in some sense especially like if you read freud's early papers i mean he saw um one of the biggest barriers to the completion of psychoanalysis being you know the family Right. And and or the intimate partner being sort of in the way of, of, of going through to analysis all the way to the end. Um, and, and one of the things that I think Alenka might help us work through through the course itself um, is how do we translate ideas from the clinic into ideas relevant to uh, socio historical processes? Right. Like what's the relate? I think that's like a big question for me is like, what's the relationship between knowledge derived from the clinic? and and politics for example like I, I think and i think the slovenian school helps us to bring that out and bring those questions out because they they do try to think about politics right they they, they don't just like freud freud could be criticized for being let's say like a a liberal or something like that like he's 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 politically liberal he and 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 i think that um in regards to even lacan's theories i mean i i don't know insofar as they've translated into a new political discourse or, or anything like that. So these are, these are the types of things we might want to 
continue to think through also in the context of, of the class with, with, all, with anyone who's, who's a part of it. Cool. Okay, so going on from that to the next slide, the thing that thinks and speaks. And this is actually, it's great that, that Dave brought up the, 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 the slips, the jokes, the dreams, because basically Freud discovered the unconscious in these partial objects, let's say, the dreams, the slips, the jokes. And he saw these as ingenious spiritual creations of the unconscious psyche, which of course Lacan would say were structured like a language. Um, and, and, and so basically when we are thinking about uh, the intelligence of the unconscious, um, oftentimes what we're what we're thinking what we're thinking about is uh, you know that that you know the, your daydreams um, that you you know the, the 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 slip of the tongue where you meant to say one thing and you said said another um, uh, and and things like that and and basically it's becoming sort of you to me the unconscious is in some sense irreducible but at the same time you can become more reflexive about the unconscious. Right. And 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 Zizek will also note that there's something about the unconscious, which is fundamentally reflexive. So it's becoming more reflexive about it. It's, it's seeing the intelligence in the unconscious. And, you know, I've had a, I've had I've had in my life, I've had some devastating slips. Right. Where where actually entire relationships were formed or fell apart based on the slip. Right, so 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 there there are reflexive moves here where where the real of our social life is is very much very much uh, related to the to the to the nature of the unconscious. Um, but the the overall point here, connecting it to the previous slide, is that we enjoy our unconscious speech much more than sex. Our daydreams, our sponta our sp our spontaneous discourse, our wordplay, our joking with others, we enjoy these things, and I think that's really the crucial dimension of reflexivity is recognizing simply recognizing how much we enjoy um this and how we enjoy like becoming more intelligent about about how we enjoy i mean it's not just all negativity abyssal confrontation with anxiety you know it, it is ultimately about joking around and and having fun talking with you know having fun in speech and 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 you know and 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 just recognizing that simply the, the satisfaction of speech and i love this point that she makes which is that Psycho and oftentimes philosophers might think that psychoanalysis debases intellectual activities by bringing sexuality into the picture, but actually she makes this great inversion that actually psychoanalysis elevates sexuality to a surprising intellectual activity. And I think that this is so crucial for the, for, for at least in my mind, becoming more um, intellectually active outside of the academy is that when you become more intellectually active outside the academy, it actually matters that you elevate sexuality to an intellectual activity. Because like we we're just describing, us doing this experimental is kind of that. I mean, the reason, the thing is, the reason why it doesn't happen is because people have to confront libidinal concentrations in order to collaborate intellectually with other people. Right, like you have to work through things to collaborate intellectually with other people. But when you're not in the academy and you're trying to build something in an abyssal way, you, it's a superpower to, 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 as it were, plug into this dimension, I think. Okay, so we'll go, go on here to the next, the next slide here. This is actually a brilliant, this is one of my favorite points that Alenka makes in the introduction to what is sex, which is she basically, on the one hand, she talks about pure philosophy and universal ontology. And on the other hand, she talks about clinical Lacanian psychoanalysis. And she says that both of these two um, extremes are what she's trying to, in some sense, sublate in her work. So on the one hand, you have pure philosophy, which has an intellectual attitude, which reduces psychoanalysis to a regional theory where sex is absent and opposed to the non-relation, whereas clinical Lacanian psychoanalysis could develop its own universal concepts and positions itself as the ultimate real, where the sex absence is like the holy grail. But she's saying both of these perspectives miss the mark and that she's trying to raise both um, the absence of sexuality to the positivity of the non-relation. That's the first point. She's trying to raise the absence of sex to the positivity of the non-relation. And it's all about how we develop relations inclusive of a, ref of a reflexivity of the non-relationship. And then she's saying, 
the absence of sex is not the holy grail, but rather a formal distortion that we need to work with as the positivity of the non-relation. So basically, you could say that Alenka has a concrete project here in what is sex. And that project is um, basically the universal implications of the non-relation and the formal distortion it implies. And I think that when we think about the social dimension and the political dimension of Alenka's work, this is where we should situate it. We should situate it in, in, in positivizing the non-relation and working with formal distortion. Um, now that might seem confusing, but I think that it's very practical in the sense that many social groups are founded and fail on an obfuscation of the non-relation, meaning they posit the ultimate relation. Like the classical example would be, we have the ultimate relation to God. Our community has the ultimate relation to God and you guys don't, right? That would be an obfuscation of the non-relation. Or if you have an ideological community where we know the thing, we have the one thing and all the other communities don't have it. This is an obfuscation of the non-relation. Or when it comes to formal distortion, it would be we have the clear view and everyone else has the, the wrong view. Right. We we think clearly, but they don't think clearly. No, 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 no. Alenka is not saying she's saying, look, and it's, you know, so basically what she's saying is whatever community it it will succeed or fail based on the way in which they work with the non-relation and the way in which they work with their own inner contradictions and antagonism. That's the success of the community. So I think this is right. this is really so go ahead, Dave. Well, and this is so perfect because right now uh, what passes itself off as politics is a game of who should speak, who should speak as defined by some essential grouping, right? And this is, uh, I love Dr. Christine Louis de Soli for this uh, in her book, Transcending Racial Divisions. She kind of focuses on the racialization aspect of this as a black woman. She's interested in the fact that people think that she should always have to speak from the position of a black woman. And this is something as a communist, she was against it for like 20 years. She focused on biological sciences. And then finally, with the, the discourse in the U.S. getting so bad, and then she lived in the U.S. for six years and she was like, this is shit. This is fucking terrible. I'm going to write a book about this. That's what she did. But she's kind of taken it further because obviously a lot of right wingers are going to be like, oh, we like this. Yeah, this is good. And oh, yeah. she's like, no, she's like, no, you shouldn't like this because everything I'm saying applies to you about with patriotism specifically. It's always patriotism, right? So patriotism is identity politics. It's what, what's the essential group and who should represent the essential group instead of, and she says, identity politics is not real politics, right? I, we should be transcending identity is her point. To, obviously, we, that doesn't mean that we ever leave identity. That doesn't mean that we don't have identities. It doesn't mean that, especially as a Black woman, her experience as a Black woman is irrelevant. No, obviously, she's going to have particular and unique insights that I don't. Mm -hmm. But those are lost if they don't have recourse to the universal, if there's not that dialectic between that particular and universal, informing, being informed by her singular self, right? Yeah. And so... Um, this idea that what we have in the United States as the theater of the world, where people look to it and think this is where our politics is headed, probably, especially I'm in Mexico right now. And, and the people that I'm friends with here say they look to the United States, they used to laugh. It was fun. It was like eat some popcorn, watch the political discourse in the United States because it's comical. Now they're scared because they're like, this is coming here. Right. Mm -hmm. the, this new level is coming here. And 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 I like that Christine's point is that that's not real politics. And so well, it's the theater. It's the this the spectacle. And this and the the how this relates to everything you're saying, to make it crystal clear, is that non-relationality being inherent to all of us and inextricable, not going to go away. And then exactly. even non-relationality non to oneself. A does not equal A. I am not a self-standing a fully knowing, you know, ego. I'm a split subject. That knowledge not being foregrounded re reduces people 
on the left and right, whether they're revolutionary reformists, whether they're bottom up, top down, it doesn't matter. It reduces them to, to cartoon brained, car, cartoon brained madness. It's, 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 it's not just theater. It's, it's like your ego just jerking off. You're, you're sitting here thinking, oh, well, the essential group is this, and I'm represented in that essential group. Oh, well, how convenient for me that the essential <laughs> group, how convenient for me that the essential group always includes me and excludes other people. How, how, how precious, right? Yeah. So this is yeah. where, this is where the reflexivity, this is the reflexive dimension. Yeah. So, so, so very concrete, very concrete. This is just about becoming more reflexive about the spontaneous motion of the driver, the spontaneous motion of the, the unconscious to, 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 to engage in, 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 in these, in these simplistic binaries, I suppose you could say. And um, also I was thinking, how hasn't the, the word contradictory politics emerged in the, in opposition to identity politics? We've got identity politics to contradictory oh, politics. I don't, why hasn't that been branded yet? Like, I feel like that's what? like, that's our <laughs> political, that's our political ground right there. <laughs> this, this should be the, the piece you write. Contradictory your, uh, politics. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that okay. is, I mean, well, cause we'll you, you took the, you took the idea of the university course with us and, you know, Carl Jaspers is ideal that he is celebrating it's you know he's saying well we're all lost in the institution and critiquing the institution but we're not thinking about what is the ideal of the university and he says well we have to define the university it in the ideal it is a community of truth seekers that all have like their own unique uh insights in fields and they are in dialogue trying their best to approximate the universal and i just think like that idea of as a, as opposed to what he calls the intellectual department store which is what we have today. He, that ideal is not one of, oh, we've reached this harmonious, holistic, unified, you know, hu human understanding. The, you know, this, this, uh, the, what Jesus critiques for people for thinking Hegel means when he says absolute idea. No, the point is to, to, to work at it though, right? Because knowledge and understanding only come through working at it. And so contradictory politics, also contradictory university, right? Yep, absolutely. So move, move, moving on, moving on here, just a, a quote from, from Alenka. The pages that follow grew out of a double conviction. And this is, this is, to me, one of her central, this is one of the most important quotes in the introduction. The pages that follow grew out of a double conviction. First, that in psychoanalysis, sex is above all a concept that formulates a persisting contradiction of reality. And second, that this contradiction cannot be circumscribed or reduced to a secondary level as a contradiction between already well-established entities or beings, but is, as a contradiction, involved in the very structuring of these entities, in their very being. In this precise sense, sex is of ontological relevance, not as an ultimate reality, but as an inherent twist or stumbling block of reality. I just love that quote. I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's so good. And it makes me just, it, it just helps me reflect on my own identity a lot, I think. Because basically what she's, what she's saying there is that sex is some persistent contradiction of reality, which we all have to work with and which our identities grow. Our identities grow out of this persistent contradiction of, 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 of sexuality. And, and so the, the more reflexive we are about this, you know, you, the more we confront sort of, I, I, I keep coming to a more true or a more real form of becoming. For some reason, a more real form of becoming makes, makes sense to me. It's not that we all become like perfectly transparent or perfectly clear, or there's no more mistakes, or we don't stumble or, or, or make a fool of ourselves anymore. It's just that we are more reflexive with the way in which we enjoy and the way in which our identity is being constructed. Oftentimes when people construct an identity, they think that again, they're not a split subject. And like, like whether it's a religious subject, whether it's a scientific subject, whether it's a, whatever the identity is, is that oftentimes it's obfuscated the way in which sexuality is, is, is involved in the construction of that identity. You know, and 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 I think that we can we can explore that a lot in in the course. Okay, so this has relevance to traditional identities. So, and and Dave brought this up a little bit as well. Is that 
So tradition, when we think about traditional concepts of man and woman universally, um, for psychoanalysis in any case, these are identities as historical responses to the sexual contradiction. They're basically ways in which human beings have logically mediated the sexual contradiction. And that doesn't mean we can just throw those concepts away. We can't just say, we can't just deconstruct man and woman universally just because, um, well, man and woman are a reflection of the repression of society or something like that. It's that man and woman have a logic to them. Their, their response, and at the same time, they're not, at the same time, they're not reified essential identities. They're, 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 they're identities which have emerged in a becoming and, and, and are going to continue to change. And they have, and they're also historically conditioned, right? Like what a man is or what a woman is in a hunter-gatherer society is different than what a man is and what a woman is in an agricultural society or an information age society. And I think the conversation that we really need to have, and I think Dave already pointed to this a little bit, is that here's an open question. What does it mean to be a man and a woman in the information age? What does it mean to be a man or a woman today? Because we're not in the same society that we were in a hundred years ago. And, and, and at the same time, if we just have the option between a traditional identity and a deconstructed identity, that's not much of a op that's not much of a, a space for growth. We have to have the question of what do we value as human beings, and how can we embed that value within the reality of sexual difference and the contradiction of sexuality at work in our identity. And, and, and to me, that is the level at which I would hope the conversation could be raised um, in, our, in our political discourse, because, because, because otherwise we just get caught in um, ridiculous moralizations and ridiculous simplifications, which frankly don't help anyone, as far as I can see. They, they don't allow a society to emerge in the first place. We just become isolated individualists. Right. So, so again, if we have a, whether it's a communist, whether it's a socialist, whether it's just a communitarian ethos, we have to be able to mediate the sexual difference. If we don't mediate the sexual difference, you can't have a community. You can't have a society. It's just, anyway, it, 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 it's, it's so important, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So and 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 ultimately free it, it, you know all of all of the Slovenian tradition like the let's say the Hegelian tradition is is organized towards this idea of freedom and and thinking about the conflict of freedom at work in history. So Alenka, for example, attempts to bring out the way Lacan's work can open something new in philosophy, as opposed to, for example, Lacan, the anti-philosopher, uh, and and of course Alenka here is is identified as a philosopher which I think is her interesting spin on Lacan, is that like Lacan would present himself as against philosophy and Alenka is not against philosophy. So she, you know, she's really trying to bring out the philosophical dimension, which is already implicit in Lacan, but not, let's say, explicit. It's like, you know, and, and I think that that's, that's a, at least where I make sense of her work. So for Lacanian, psychoanal Lacanian psychoanalysis for Zupancic can be enlisted in the Freudian Marxist subjective struggle for an objectivity related to historical freedom, right? Did Lacan think that through? Like, I don't know if Lacan really thought that through, right? So she's trying to think that through. She's trying to think the way in which this is all a part of a larger historical struggle involving political economy. Right, libidinal economy and political economy need to be thought together, and 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 she, I guess the Slovenian school does its part in trying to think that through, and that objectivity must be conceived differently than scientific objectivity, as sort of we've already alluded to a little bit, an objectivity which is disconnected from the process of a subject of a subject's historical freedom is not a true objectivity. That oftentimes science, although it's purporting to approach a certain form of objectivity, that objectivity does not include or is not interested in the subject's historical freedom. And that's really what, what this philosophical tradition is trying to think, trying to um, organize itself towards. Um, and I think this is the final slide and then we can open up to a Q&A. So I know it's been a long presentation, but let me just get through this slide and then we'll open it up. I'll, I'll let Dave give his final, um, say on it and then and then we'll we'll open it up to a q a so ultimately here 
uh, thinking about libidinal politics, where the real of sex and power, there's no, here Alenka is saying, there's no center or balanced objectivity or like a pure symmetry, but rather there's an objective antagonism or conflict that we can learn to work with, that we can become more reflexive um, about. And that the subject's abyssal freedom is navigating the becoming without a resolution on a political or a sexual utopia, but rather an incomplete and open partial engagement, right? So we're, we're not going towards a world in which everything is reconciled and everything is resolved and there's no more problems and, you know, like, like, like a, a classical idea of utopia. There's always going to be struggles, but we can become more reflexive about the incompleteness and the openness of our identities, basically. And she also recommends um, supplementary materials in both The Trouble with Pleasure by Aaron Schuster, which focuses on Deleuze and psychoanalysis, and also Lorenzo, Lorenzo Chesa, I'm not sure if I pronounced that last name right, Chesa's, The Not Two, which focuses on God and logic. And I think these two recommendations from Alenka are very interesting because they again point to what Dave brought up about the trad and the trans. On the one hand, you have the Deleuzean multiplicity of identity that would be the trouble with pleasure and how does analysis deal with the Deleuzean multiplicity for example and then on the other hand you have the trad identity and the question of how do we think about god and logic right and and how is sexuality involved in questions about god and logic i think the, these are big questions these are meta philosophical mega questions and and, and Alenka pointing to these and also in her own work, working through these problems um, is probably the reason why, at least I'll speak for me, approaching these problems are the reason why I do this work and the reason why I continue doing this work, because I think we should engage fundamental philosophy and we should engage fundamental uh, theology, um, but, but also, um, you know, um, thinking about these from the perspective of psychoanalysis as well, and thinking about the, the role of sexuality in, in, in these dimensions of life. So, um, yeah, if you have any final thoughts there, Dave, uh, go for it. Wonderful. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, thank you for doing more of the work in, prepare, in preparing and putting together this amazing lecture. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation with everybody here. Like, the fact that we've had, like, a solid 22 people like almost the entire time has been really, really cool. And so I'm, I'm excited for the course that's coming up. Um, but I want to say two things. One is about uh, bracketing. And, you know, when Heidegger's talking about what Husserl does in the development of phenomenology, he says that phenomenology is a possibility of even being able to do philosophy anymore. Mm -hmm. And what he means in part is this idea of bracketing, which is a sort of, the way that Heidegger is using that is, is it an elaboration or extension, an, an, uh, like an add-on to the Nietzschean project of sort of a, a perspectivism, right? Which is to say that you cannot get on underway in the analysis of anything ever in any way without bracketing out everything else, right? So the, for, the, the background, is always being bracketed out so you can foreground something that you're focusing on. And this is true for every science, for every discursive field. There's just certain assumptions, operating assumptions, presuppositional frameworks um, that are being bracketed out that are normally operative in other spheres. And then there are ones that are being usually, um, if it's going to be a long lasting field, um, explicitly put into operation, right? And so, and then later you can critique any science for you know the the un, unchecked assumptions for the for the baggage that it brought in without realizing it but any really thoroughgoing effort into understanding tries to be clear about what are the assumptions at work here and then bracketing out other ones right and the reason that i bring this up is you know lacan is obviously profoundly influenced by phenomenology, but he makes a break from it. And as you said, he's an anti-philosopher. And yeah. I think that there's a very sophomoric way of interpreting that, that I want to uh, warn people against. And that is assuming that that means if you want to be a Lacanian, then you just don't need philosophy. And the point right. is, the point is, if you want to, to, to do 
continental philosophy. You can't just have your one thinker and then just read that thinker. It's not going to work because they all consciously are aware that they are bracketing. And when they yep. say that they're against something like Foucault saying he will not do a normative analysis, he's not going to qualify good and bad kinds of power. That is a form of bracketing because he wants to see something that other people are not able to see. When Deleuze is hates uh, negativity, the fact is, is uh, there's a strong case to be made that this is a methodological um, form of bracketing. And you and I and everyone else who's getting into theory now and in the future needs to keep in mind that you as, an, as a singular theorizing subject trying to make sense of this world are going to be doing that as well. And the point is to read different thinkers and be thinking, what are they bracketing? And not as a form of critique merely, but just as a way of understanding how you'll be able to apply them to the world of of stuff that we want to understand between ourselves and society. And so um, to, to bracket out philosophy is perfectly valid, considering the fact that philosophy had bracketed out drive and enjoyment. And then lastly, right, science, science is abstract objectivity, meaning that yep. biology is an abstraction. Yeah. Uh, everything, every, every science is an abstraction and it's an abstraction that relies on bracketing out all the rest of stuff of life. And so the, the goal of philosophy is to dip in and dive into and, uh, and drill into these various fields, but always kind of coming back to, okay, so how do these fit together? And then the key here is the non-relationality. In a lot of cases, there's not going to be a relation and understanding how they don't fit is more important than understanding how they have similarities. So everybody, thank you so much for being here and I'm excited to talk. So yeah, thank you for being here for this long lecture. Yeah. Okay. So there's actually, there's actually one more, one more quote. Oh. So in this, uh, in, in this, in this sense, the objectivity is linked here to the very capacity of being partial or partisan. I think this is actually an important point for us to reflect on a little bit, Dave. As Althusser puts it, when dealing with a conflictual reality, which is the case for both Marxism and psychoanalysis, one cannot see everything from everywhere. Some positions dissimulate this conflict and some reveal it. One can thus discover the essence of this conflictual reality only by occupying certain positions and not others in this very conflict. What this book aims to show and argue is that sex or the sexualized precisely the sexual is precisely such a position or a point of view in psychoanalysis, not because of its dirty or controversial contents, but because of the singular form of contradiction that it forces us to see, to think, and to engage with. So just basically here saying, yeah, I mean, I think, Dave, both of us in some sense fall into this partisanship where, yeah, we do see class difference. Yeah, we do see sexual difference. In some sense, we're partisans for not one, like not necessarily one or the other side of the difference, but for the difference, like there is, the if you obfuscate this difference, you're not thinking society. If you obfuscate this difference, you're not thinking the human, human existence. You know, human existence involves sexual difference. Society involves class difference. If we don't think these things, then we're not really thinking the real of the of of, of our socio historical situation. So let's just double check. Yeah, that's actually the last slide. So I think that's actually an important point, um, and I think it brings us to um, an important dimension. And again, like Dave said, thank you so much for your time and for your attention. Um, and before we open up to Q and A, just want to say that this is an introduction for a course which is going to be starting on May the seventh. It is a course that Dave and I are co-teaching. It's an experiment. You saw the beginning of this experiment today. Um, you can sign up for this course either through Philosophy Portal where this course is being offered in connection to a course on Lacan, which starts this summer. The point and the logic behind that is that I think it would be very interesting to do a deep dive into what is sex, which is by a Lacanian philosopher, before diving into Lacan's core writings. It's sort of like a preparatory jump into Lacan's core writings where we can think through what's actually being said in the contemporary field today. What are the problems which we're trying to think through and how can we go into Lacan thinking as, as contemporaries? And then this course is also being taught through Theory Underground. So whether you go through Philosophy Portal, whether you go through Theory Underground, that's not so much as important as 
Um, Dave and I are both teaching this course and we're both hoping to bring Alenka's work um, into the spotlight it deserves because I think she's asking very interesting questions. She's a very important theor theoretician and um, we want to bring her work to the spotlight. So with that, I'll stop sharing. And um, I guess the best, easiest way to do that is just to do the, the raising hand function. So if you, if, if you want to raise your hand, um, go for it and, and, and we'll, we'll stick around for as long as the conversation is alive, I suppose. Just want to say, um, yeah, nice, nice to see you there, Chitan. Nice to see you, Big Stig. And uh, uh, anyone else there who, who wants to put their camera on and go for it, Big Sig, go for it. Hey, what's going on? I actually wasn't trying to raise my hand right away. I just had it right there, but I, I guess I'll go anyway. Um, I can you hear me? By the way. Oh yeah, you're coming through. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, so hot, dog, hot dogs and all there. Yep, I got Z in the background. I guess what I have is more of like a, a comment and like uh, something that I really find profound about this text. And I really like how you ended it uh, in the slide, which bringing over uh, over determination, both in the Marxist sense of class difference and then with uh, sexuality. Because I think one thing that th this text points out with sexuality, which is something in the early Frodo Marxist tradition didn't realize, and you can even see with like uh, someone like um, Reich and then carried on by like the libertinism of D&G is that, oh, if uh, we just get rid of the social uh, oppression, then, you know, everything will be fine. Well, really, they confuse repression with the social repression. And if I'm not mistaken, Freud emphasizes that you have uh, primary repression and secondary repression and secondary repression is the one that could be emphasized with the installation of core values of societal norms of uh, the mediation of the superego and how that interjects within us and how we feel like you know the gaze of the other or of you know power relations whatever terminology you want to use you know pick you know pick your choice but the key is, is that it has to do with the socius or the social apparatus but the social or the primary repression is something that is, you could say, maybe constitutive to sexuality itself, and that it's this libidinal excess. So it has to go on un, become unconscious because it's in this like seesaw of repression and sublimation. And one thing that is I find very interesting is that, uh, you know, as you were saying that the drive can't be really deconstructed, right? It's literally like this thing that keeps moving and, and thus it takes on a life of its own. And pretty much, I mean, the last thing I'll say is that like this shows that we have to grapple at this thing ontologically and not try to like disavow and be like, well, you know, I know that social identity is a construction. Nonetheless, I believe that, you know, if we change our identities, our sexual orientation, that everything will be happy. Like, no, there's still a, a root antagonism that's being uh, concealed by these different discourses that maintain a mystification based on their presuppositions and don't get at the root of the contradictions and antagonisms. Like the classic DNG mystification of wanting to become bumblebees or something. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about that a little bit. No, I think that's really well expressed. Um, I think that's, that's, and I think I tried to bring that up a little bit. I think Zizek brings up, you know, what is often seen in a postmodern philosophy as social oppression is actually sexuality is itself oppressive. So I think that that's really, really great that you, you centered on that. Um, Nick, do you want to, you want to jump in here? Yeah. Um, I wanted to pick up on something you had said earlier uh, that I found really insightful that I'd never thought about before, but um, I just thought it was really neat how you related the unconscious to this question of identity, the classic trope of A equals A. And I think it sort of, it relates to the the very title of the the book itself that we're focused on. Something that hadn't occurred to me, I hadn't noticed it until I listened to an interview with Alenka, um, the Machinic Unconscious interview, is that the name of the book isn't just what is sex, but what is sex, it's italicized. So the reason I wanna emphasize that is it seems to me that like, okay, a uh, superficial understanding of the unconscious from this point of view 
might just translate in people's heads as like, oh, so this is just endlessly elusive horizon because we can't really nail down any kind of identity. So what's the point? What's the point of pursuing sexuality, of, of even focusing on sex if it's just, you know, the something that uh, is constitutively inaccessible to us and pertains to the unconscious, but that is aspect of it. Uh, to me means that what we're dealing with is, yes, something that is never substantially self-identical, but is always animating discourse and is always animating social dynamics in general. So it's like we, we embrace contradiction for that reason. We work through contradiction, not to the, get to the other side of it, but because contradiction is liberatory in that sense. Just a comment. I don't know if um, you want to build off of that or. Dave, do you want to, do you want to jump in on that? What's up, Nick? <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> chilling, chilling. Um, I think that's great. Um, and this, uh, thinking about, thinking about, the like a a deconstruction of the law of identity yeah and individualism and the assumptions the ontological assumptions that come with individualism um is for me one of those big light bulb moments over the past like five years that has really uh it's been like this dawning realization of how a lot of what's going on in deconstruction or with Heidegger or these other thinkers who challenge the law of identity. I mean, Hegel's like, come on, the king of this. The, what's going on is always relevant to politics and to our immediate lived ideological uh, existences. And we tend to think, oh, it's like this, this logic game. It's like this remote logic game. And it's like, obviously, this, what I'm holding right here is a glass of, you know, of a little bit of water left over. It, uh, it, there's obviously like this pragmatic sense in which like, yeah, this is this. But, you know, the phenomenology of spirit starts out with that immediacy and goes, yeah, but this is not this. And this, what is this though? We, we use this placeholder, but it's like this it's like this universal placeholder. It's not the particular thing that you're holding in your hand. You're using a universal placeholder that you're putting onto the thing, right? And so that creates all these contradictions and then it unfolds the entire phenomenology of spirit. But yeah, at a pragmatic level, uh, this glass is not this coffee cup, is not this pen. And so obviously it's really easy for people who like to do like logic crunching and analytic stuff to be like, yeah, but also this is this and not that. And we go, yeah, for sure. True. But when we do this deconstruction of our assumptions about identity in the realm of appearances or in the symbolic, then it also applies to politics in the way that I brought up earlier. And so, yeah, this is kind of just like a, an ongoing kind of like mind blown in the same way. I think it's similar to Inform They Know Not What They Do when we're thinking about the subject of enunciation versus the enunciated subject um, and how it, what kind of subject are we talking about? Are we talking about the human subject or are we talking about the grammatical subject? Both, both. And so anytime you're thinking, how does this, how, where does the rubber meet the road? You always got to remember it's both, right? And so, yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. This is kind of the ongoing mind blown explosion here. Adam. What's up, guys? Um, one of the uh, one of the insights that I had, or at least I don't know, sn sneaking suspicions, is that there is some overlap between uh, Zupanchik's uh, suggestion that we need to go back to the construction site. We need to we need to revisit the things that have seemed to have been just determined. Uh, figured out, like sex has been figured out, so we don't need to talk about it anymore in psychoanalysis. We can just move on to the, you know, what provision of services and solutions and such. Um, 
and uh, the overlap with that and uh, Mark Hu's uh, idea of repressive desublimation um, and the the notion of I don't know I guess the operation operationalism of everyone knowing their place in the conversation and let's just get on with the business of individually taking care of ourselves um, and I I was wondering if if anyone else. Uh, sees sees that or if I'm just kind of just grabbing grabbing things that are apparently interesting to me in the moment um it, I'm, I, I'm is there is the is the question there is is Alenka's is Alenka's work also forwarding an ethics of repressive desublimation no, actually, the uh, the opposite. Oh. That's that's what I'm wondering. Is is I, I'm wondering to what degree there's there's overlap with the with the the concept that you know we need to get we need to get to a place where we're not just taking the ex, the authoritative view of what's what sex is uh, what has been determined, and instead uh revisit like she's saying revisit what is sex itself what is the what is the point of sex in in the conversation i'm 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 drawing from a, a question that i had asked uh, i believe mikey and dave or earlier on which is why uh, why is there such an ins insistence on dealing with sex in psychoanalysis and there and along with that what how does that how does that affect people like for example myself who do not experience the sexual drive to such a degree that I that I see other people. Um, does that mean that I'm not part of this conversation, or does it not apply to me? And uh, and I I've, I've just I found a profound uh, shift in my understanding of the point just within this introduction alone, where she's she's pointing out, no, this is this is a, about about understanding the nature of sex as how we conceptualize the the divide between the unconscious and the conscious and how we can start to understand subjectivity, um, sex being a, a kind of universal that we all must deal with, but we need to deal with it ont ontologically and we, we haven't yet. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, and I think, I think as it relates to, you know, I think the, the whole confusion with psychoanalysis and sexuality comes in with the fact that psychoanalysis has a very expanded or enlarged notion of sexuality. Like it's not what most people think of when we say sexuality, like, like she said in the text, it's like the way in which psychoanalysis is thinking about sexuality is almost related to enjoyment and speech. And most people don't think about sexuality that way. So it's, it, it, it really does. It, it's really about a certain libidinal enjoyment, which is, um is is in some sense an effect of language uh itself but and, and i guess that's that's just that's sort of like the novel distinction that 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 emerges there with the talking cure that is 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 often not thought of in relationship to the let's say the pop notion of sex um chitan did you want to did you want to jump in here yeah oh, i i i just i i'm sorry oh, sorry i'm just sorry before <laughs> Chitan, i just wait. Yeah, go ahead. i'm about I'm, a, I'm about to step away. I'm going to grab some more coffee and water. I'll be able to hear everyone while I step away. Chitin, hopefully I'll get to contribute once I get back after you've uh, said your piece. But uh, Adam, I just wanted to say, I remember when you asked that question, and I think I remember saying something along the lines of, yeah, basically, it's just not what you normally think of when you say sex, which is the problem here. But for me, just to kind of sh to, to break the habit of equating what we normally speak of as sexuality and sex, with uh, what's being talked about in psychoanalytic sense. That's why I tend to revert to libidinal economy because it's, it's not just how do you manage like hard-ons and orgasms as a, you know, a mailed body or whatever. No, 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 it's, it's, it's also like talking, shopping, gambling, drinking, you know, staying up late, later than you think you probably should or waking up later than you think you probably should, anything that involves guilt and shame, like all of it, right? And so libidinal economy is kind of where I go to as a way to break the habit. But yeah, hearing from you just now, I'm really glad Cadell got you to expand on that because to me, I think that that means it really has clicked for you. And so that was a really great uh, explanation of what she's saying. I think you did a great job. I'll be right back. 
All right. Coffee is an absolute necessity. And <laughs> all right, Chita, and jump it, in here. It's it's decaf. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to sort of uh, say apologize first. I was driving at that time. I wanted to hear you also. <laughs> I was just, uh, yeah. Um, uh, actually, th there's something very really interesting in this discussion, you know, uh, that that when we start focusing on sexuality from the Lacanian perspective, it's almost as if we lose the reference for sexuality itself in, in the in normal human community. Because in, say, in the Panchik also, uh, human sexuality in, in that sense, you know, as, as we know it, is already artificial and secondary in nature, if I'm not wrong. Am I right? You know, that 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 that, that normal human sexuality as we as we refer to it is already secondary and artificial in that sense, which is why and and usually every time uh, we start thinking of sexuality from this Lacanian uh, lens, we actually end up more closer to language. You know, uh, then we end up and end up thinking about you know um, the, the the forced unification that is needed for reproduction to take place. You know, because the reproduction is already a forced unification happening upon partial drive in that sense, and which is which is never whole, which is never complete, which is never so. Uh, and I think much of the discussion between Foucault and Lacan also gets confused because Foucault is referring to something else when he's discussing sexuality and Lacan is referring to something else in that sense and from right in, 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 in that line. I, I wonder how, 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 do you, how do you think through this problem of uh, language actually falling on the side of partial drives and then starts falling on, on the side of uh, this reproduction and so on and so forth. And, and biology not able to actually, you know, grasp that problem yes no that's a very important question um the way the way i always think about this so like as sort of was um, mentioned in the presentation that i sort of made this distinction between evolutionary reductionism and psychoanalysis as it and there's very practical examples that we can think about this like evolutionary psychology reducing our motives to we just want sex or sexual selection or something like that is that from it's like basically the split between Darwin and Freud that when it comes to the partial drives when it comes to the partial drives falling on or language falling on the side of the partial drives rather than reproduction is basically in the evolutionary biological view everything sex is reducible to reproduction but in the psychoanalytic view sexuality is reducible to enjoyment so it's like this difference between reproduction and enjoyment and I think this fissure like this is a very practical fissure and a necessary fissure to go into because in the traditional worldview, it was precisely that the whole worldview functioned to reduce sexuality to reproduction. Like you don't have sex before marriage, you have sex within certain constraints, everything is organized around reproduction. But now more and more humans are trying to, as it were, use sexuality as a form of social communication. It's not, sexuality is not anymore for reproduction. Like, it's well, it can be for reproduction, but the point of sexuality is more and more. And this is why I think it's such an interesting question for social politics, communist politics, um, is that sexuality is basically an intelligent form of social communication. And actually, sexuality is, is look, sexuality is in you showing up for this presentation, Chitin. Sexuality is you raising your hand and engaging and me and we, us having a, like, like that's, it, it really is like, we're, I gave the example of Dave and I, Dave and I getting to the point where we could give a presentation together. Like that's, it's all, it's so important to think about sexuality in this way because you start to see the violence in your own speech. You start to see the violence and you start to, you have, you know, it's all about the other. It's all about the dance with the other and how we enjoy. So I think, I think, the fact that language falls on the side of the partial drives rather than reproduction is, I, I think it, there's, it, it's not a coincidence that that's why I think Lacan formulated his algorithm of the barred subject and the object patia, that, that something here happens between the animal and the human. I, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this because I remember in our talks on the return to Freud, this question of the distinction between animal and human is so, you articulate it so nicely. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, this problem actually keeps on interesting me, you know, that, that how, do, how, do, how do we keep on going back to, uh, because to be honest, uh, 
in my own thinking, when when we start thinking between this this, this movement from Kant to Hegel, eventually, and and if you start reading Hegel's science of logic uh, through the, the, the Wittgensteinian lens in some senses, a lens which actually tries to think through the relationship of Hegel's logic through language in, in that in that sense, which is what happens in in, in the Lagrangian thinking, and from there we enter into say you know the, the questions of say the an animal human in that sense, we immediately see that the distinction between animal and human is not a distinction where we are trying to think that animal is A and human is, human is B. In fact, human being is an articulation or, or, or I, I would say it in the a last articulation of something that already exists in the animal in that sense. It's, it's, it's you know, it, and that articulation is actually a, a linguistic articulation. It, it is eventually determined, determined and concretized in, in language itself, you know, and which is why Ronald, Ronald Barthes actually, I think, got it right when he said that, that it's not that linguistics is, is, is a, a branch of semiotics. In, in fact, all semiotics is eventually linguistics in that sense, you know, it, it, it is a branch of uh, uh, linguistics. What he, what he means by it is that eventually all sign systems actually lead us to language. Not the other way around. Not la language being a sub part or a particular instantiation of different science systems in that sense, which is how you get unconscious structure like a language. You know those kind of formulations start coming uh, coming into being. Or uh, famously, Wittgenstein's theory of language game, which is essentially a question of that all all our interactions are structured through grammar in that sense. Eventually, you what you get in a language game is a particular form of grammar. You know. So all of these spaces, actually, what you what you get is this strange kind of a of of a journey of on one side, which is this this stumbling block block of reality, which we we call sexuality, and we you know, and and relationship of this this twist in reality to language, that is what we slip into, and that is what and and it is these slippages that we see in animals around us, you know, whose who, whose final point becomes in some senses the human. Uh, animal in in that sense, and this twist uh, in itself is is not the point of human. This tip twist, as Anka Zupantik says, is the point of inhuman in us. You know, in, in that sense, all our all our sexual activities and all our stress is not simply us being human beings. It is the point of <laughs> you know, it, it is already artificial, secondary, and so on and so forth. Culture, se uh, sexual practices, and you know. Uh, so, ah, I think, and I think that's where the big conflict comes between sexuality and religion, is that in sexual, it's not that sexuality is animal instinct debasing us. It's that in sexuality, I think Zizek says this: religion meets its true competitor. You know, the inhuman dimension. You know, the inhuman within the human. And just to sort of say one thing, one of the things that that I think one of the things that we should we should, we can enforce us to articulate sexuality on the side of partial drives rather than human sexuality in that sense, as we see it, is that no matter what we do, once we enter into repetition, did I give the give the example at some point? You know, when you shake somebody's hand one time, you know, it, it's it's normal. When you shake it second time, it, I, or third time, fourth time, it either becomes sexual or comic, and that that relationship between. Uh, these two, these two, or like uh, or aggressive, violent, or aggressive violence, yeah, right, like, like, like this is like, like, like if like literally like the way he gives that example sometimes is like you get immediately creeped out. <laughs> Absolutely, you know. So what, this relationship between repetition and sexuality actually tells you that 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 sexuality is not simply normal human sexuality in that sense and usually when we discuss this when i discuss it in my same my classes also the response i get is that their reference point of sexuality is normal human to sexuality and in fact all ideal sexual assault for at least young girls comes from because their idea of normal human sexuality gets gets in some senses uh, threatened in, in, in those acts of sexual transgressions in that sense. And it is extremely interesting that that they cannot articulate or conceptualize sexuality away from normal human sexuality in our in our cultural discourse to, in today's time. And what what is at stake and in, in, and why that is happening is something I think we need to you know think about as such. Could you could you go into a little bit more that example you were just giving with the notion of sexuality being threatened by the assault? So uh, 
uh, when I so I teach in a girls' college, um, usually undergrad. You know, so when we when we're discussing sexuality in class, which inevitably happens you know, every year, two or three times or four times in that sense, what you get is that young girls already have a notion of sexuality, which is in some senses without the non relation as you're talking about it, you know, which is complete in, in that sense. And they already have a complete notion of sexuality, where sexuality for them gets formed on the side of reproduction and on, the, on, on that side. And whenever they are transcribed sexually as beings, which in Delhi normally girls are, whether it's in metros, buses, you know, they have these experiences of sexual transgression one, one side or the other. Or in today's time, what is interesting is most young girls do not even, are not even able to recognize when they are being sexually transgressed and when something violent is upon happening upon them or something, something, you know, these, these lines are becoming increasingly blurred for the next generation. For us, what was comical might become sexual for them in that sense. You know, we, we, what, is, what is interesting is that this, this problem gets intensified because they are already thinking sexuality to be a complete thing, a completely separate thing from the other activities. Because they've already internalized sexuality as something distinct from other activities. They are not prepared for it to enter into other activities. Which is why a girl talking to a girl feels more safer than a girl talking to a boy because they feel safer because for them sexuality becomes something from which they can be they can be protected by, by cordoning it off into certain fixed static zones of their lives. And I realize that once they become open, that sexuality can enter into any space that they're inhabiting. And it's a question of how they engage with it rather than how they coordinate it off. Um, I, I, I find that most people become much more open to dealing with that question much more, even if it's, if it's a little violent upon them, much more openly than when they are actually thinking of sexuality in certain fixed and static zones of, of their lives. That is supposed to only come in that space, not in this space, you know? I, I think that's, I think to, to me, to me that the, the point you're bringing up is, is in some sense, um, the definition of being a mature human adult is like that, that, you know, se sexuality can't just be some marked off and closed off in that corner over there. And then all the rest of our life is asexual. And that's like the whole problem with the institutional culture is, and the, you get all weird things happening with institutional culture precisely because of that view where you'll have like, you know, and you give many examples where basically you have uh, immature relationships to sexuality precisely because you have the view that it can be cordoned off as opposed to it's kind of everywhere. Like you, and you have, like I've had many, or I've seen many examples where this is like a problem in, I don't know, like for example, gym spaces, like where people don't know how to interact with each other in gyms anymore because any, anything might be seen as a transgression, anything might be seen as potentially offensive, anything might be seen as, you know, so, there is a way in which what's on the line here is just a more, more mature, uh, a more, more mature understand. And I think that's what Freud's point was when he, he talked about infantile sexuality, when he was talking about that. Anyway, and this is the whole reaction to, to psychoanalysis. <laughs> Almost as if you are not prepared for sexuality to enter into different spaces. You know, we, we think of sexuality as something which, which, which is not supposed to be there in, in you know, um, and we, we can't see its creative side in that sense. We can't see it, you know. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Great. Great to have you here, Chetan. Um, is there really good stuff? Is there any, any, any other, any other, maybe not, maybe not, doesn't have to be a question. It could just be something that was provoked, something that was alive for you, uh, something that you want to share. Um, otherwise, I, uh, uh, yeah, go for it, Dave. I wanted to acknowledge a few people in the chat who probably can't participate because they're at work. Um, but I see Michael Downs, who's probably at work right now. Um, we have Isabel, Isabel Millar in the Isabel oh, Millar. Is a, I was just going to say, yeah, Isabel Millar is here, Nance and Philip. So it's really good to see you all. Those are the names I recognize. But if any of you who haven't contributed, including other names that I did not just read off, like uh, Raza, Reza, Ryan, Etc. Yep, if you, Max, if you, yeah, if you, um, something that you'll be thinking about or that you want us to talk about a little bit further, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. 
I just actually have a question. Why do you think the trad and the trans are so, are, are mega issues? I think it's it, it that's it's a fundament it's, it's a fundamental it's fundamental um, binary that seems to be emerging to to today and I and I think it, it's it's interesting. My point in the presentation, and I think I like the way that Dave also brought it up in the presentation, is I think this is a good background question for the course as such. Like I think that that like it's very grounding. It's it's something we can probably all relate to. Um, Max, I know like in your work, you you work through these, you're working through a lot of this in your in your writing between trad and trans. On the one hand, I think the 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 trans is just this there's a desire to be free there's a desire to be liberated like i can construct anything i can i can become anything like this is a very um almost spontaneous intuition that human beings have inside themselves and i think that 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 people see sexuality as the site of that freedom and then the trad thing is just that because our environment is so different from a historical environment, I think people are just looking for an identity to hold on to that would give them some orientation. Like, and if there's already a religious structure or if there is already a traditional structure that can just give you the identity, so to speak, so you don't have to go through the abysmal mediation, then I think people will just jump onto that. Yeah, no, I I love I love that, and um, I'd be curious to see some of your work, Max. But for me, I think that there's the, the there's a um, there's a superficial level where it's like they're just reacting to each other, and that is true sometimes, right? Where a person has bought into thinking about the culture war, the way that jedi talk about the light side and the dark side of the force and they <laughs> and as long as they are on the light side right they think that they're on the good side then anything that looks like the other side is just bad and needs to be defeated and then personal forms of identification can be seen as a weapon against that and so that's why i think for myself at my more naive fusionist leftist stage what uh i was gender queer and non-binary and all this you know and it's not for me non-binary non-binarity was was supposed to be a rejection of the 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 gender split but i think what it also became for me was a disavowal of this contradiction itself and the uh, mike michael downs is uh the phallus post as well as a lot of our conversations around lacan um fundamentally changed how I think about these things. And it's still kind of all, I'm working through it. But what you do see though, is that people people are rejecting, I'll speak for my own position. I was rejecting this idea that to be a man, I have to kill a deer. To be a man, I have to know how to, you know, do maintenance on my truck. To be a man, I have, right? Because other people police me and try to tell me what they think I need to be. And it's for my position, I'd be like, well, if you're a man, you'd read critique of pure reason, phenomenology, spirit, logic of science, you know, being in time. If you're a man, then you would, I would have my own litany of things, but I don't even want to participate in this. I think it's silly. And so that was, I was trying to reject the conversation, but I think my, my new, my new position is like the conversation is not one that can be rejected without being in a position of fetishistic disavowal. And so um, that's, and, and, and especially when it comes to the phallus post, my, I can, perform gender in a lot of ways, but my, my, my subjectivity has a structure to it that is not fully within my control. And there are formative things about that structuring that means that I have fundamentally um, uh, traditional male masculine experiences, right? Um, and, and I think I was in a position of disavowal towards that. I was not aware of it. Now, to say that people are just reacting against one another's sides, and I was probably a naive progressivist fusionist, like, as I'm saying, is not to say that everyone is. And I think on the deeper side, traditional society existing today 
it's it doesn't make any sense. There's no such thing. But I do believe we'll use the Amish as an example that there is a something of value that is hard to understand as an urban um, domesticated human. There's something of value in trying to keep alive something without fully knowing why you're trying to keep it alive. You say, this thing seemed to have worked in the past. We're going to honor that and we're going to maintain it, okay? Evolutionarily speaking, uh, it makes sense that there's a lot of reasons that things developed and we don't actually know why we do those things. And then priests or pastors come along and they rationalize why we do those things, but they've just rationalized it. And to debunk their rationalizations as illogical or contradictory doesn't necessarily get at the root of why that thing may have worked and might still be applicable today. And I'm not saying that it's so deep for say a regular Amish person or an Eastern Orthodox person or whatever, but I, I do personally, as part of my pluralistic worldview, I do see a value in radical experiments. And I think when we think of radical experiments, we would think of trance. But I would also say that there are various ways of trying to be traditional or homesteading or what have you that are also radical experiments. And they might be trying to salvage something that is indeed anachronistic, out of date, doesn't belong in society anymore. It's gonna prove itself contradictory in ways that are non-tenable, non-feasible, it will collapse. But there will be other times where something that they're trying to preserve, it actually turns out it still has a continued relevance today. And we were not aware of it because we're so progressive and so quick to leave everything behind. On the side of the trans issue, we are going to explore the universe if we, if we, if we don't destroy ourselves on this planet. And uh, cybernetic modifications. I know people say, oh, it's, it's messed up to reduce trans identity to transhumanism. Fair enough. We should never be purely reductive. But there is a thing about our ability to be, uh, being human is also, as the, uh, the, the xenofeminists say, is about self-alienation. And uh, you know, even, the, even the, the horse-drawn buggy for an Amish person is a form of self-alienation. You are fast forwarding processes that are necessary for the reproduction of life so that you don't have to do it all yourself. You don't have to carry everything yourself. You're, you're utilizing techne. And the question is, is well, and the, I, I think the, the, from my position as a, uh, I'm interested in philosophy of science and media theory, all forms of techne are radical experiments in self-alienation. And that is our nature as humans is self-alienation through various forms of techne. And so cybernetic evolution, taking that into our own hands and exploring the heavens is, we're on the threshold of it today. And the contradictions between trad and trans are only going to become more pronounced over the next hundred years. They're never gonna go away. People who act like this is a specific cultural moment and we'll all grow up in five or 10 years. I think that they just haven't really come to terms with a pluralistic, future. So you see it intensifying. Yeah, especially for the next 10 years, but do, yeah. do you see it? Do you, is there a critical level where, um, because we are always oscillating between conversation and violence and um, I mean, it just seems that conversation is breaking down. I mean, it does, does it hit, does it hit a critical mass where, um, because this is what, um, who, who said it? it's either exit voice or loyalty. That's the three options that you have. Um, exit voice or loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. Hirschman. Hirschman, I think yeah. is the guy who, who had this, um, where the institutions themselves, like, I mean, for a lot of conservatives, the institutions themselves, they just don't have trust in them anymore. Is there a critical mass of, of when trust in a sense just evaporates? I mean, if you're seeing it becoming more intense, this is just sort of, I suppose, the projection into the future. Yeah. We don't know. I, I, try, I try not to just, you know, obviously I want this to come back to the text eventually, but just I, I, this is just my opinion, but I think that 
we live in a post-trust world and some people just haven't come to terms with that. And if we can't develop post-trust, we can. if we can't develop post-trust oh. institutions, it will be the end of humanity. If we can develop post-trust institutions, there might be a future. Like that is, I think that we, the, 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 the solution, say Mexi the leftist from Canada, she always says move at the speed of trust. I say, no, we need post-trust institutions. I don't, I, I, I do, I want to have some people in my life I can trust, but the idea that the institutions have to trust me or that I have to trust the institutions. Yeah. It's, it is an important, this is an important question. I feel like there's something important here with in Zizek's latest work in surplus enjoyment. He says, what's more revolutionary than contemporary leftists is self-revolutionizing capital itself. And one of the interesting things of self-revolutionizing capital is that people, when they talk about the blockchain, for example, they talk about it as a trust net. Like they, th they, they talk about block blockchain as the revolution in trust, that it allows us to have um, an, an economy we can, and I don't know if it's just ideology, but this dimension of trust, I think is so crucial. On a, on a spiritual level in the men's work I've done in the last few years, the central thing I struggled with is trust. Like it just came up again and again and again and again. And there's interesting because in the contemporary Hegelian literature, Robert Brandon just released a book called The Spirit of Trust. Yeah. And, um, and, and Zizek counters that book by saying that we should embody the spirit of distrust. That, yeah. that actually, um, and that's the thing is that, you know, it's like, if you, if you have the a priori of trust, it can, your, your social environment can just be crumble so quickly. Yeah, yeah. But if you embody the spirit of distrust, it's almost like you can work with the contradictions of identity more easily. It's like, cause you don't assume the other person. Is, like there's a difference also between someone breaking your trust and someone like actively betraying you. Yeah. Right. Like, so we yeah. have to make that distinction between people are imperfect people are not necessarily trying to hurt you or people are not necessarily trying to destroy you, but they can. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's so like, there's something about human social reality, which is inherently dangerous. Like, and just by engage, like, like my first girlfriend, my first girlfriend hurt me. Was she trying to hurt me? No. Does it mean she's an untrustworthy person? Not necessarily. You know, but it's but it's at the same time that being in intense, intimate relationships, there's the possibility to have trust broken. It's like a feature of human relationships in some sense. Yeah. 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 It's good. Yeah. Post trust. Um, and, you know, negotiating difference. Yeah. Because. There has to be a way for us to, you know, this is very interesting how we, we are at the moment in how we relate to difference. You know, some difference in one group is, is, you know, seen as good. But then if you go on other differences, it's seen as an existential threat and it, it's treated as a virus, you know, I have to get away from this. Um, yeah, interesting. 100%. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks as always, Max. Chitan and then Raza. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to sort of continue with the controversial uh, debate in that sense. And you know, uh, there's something very interesting happening in the in the gender wars that, are, that is taking place today. And I'm, I live in India, so I live quite far away from what is happening in Canada, US, and Europe in that uh, in, in that sense. But you know, I've got friends over there, and and the minute something on the question of gender comes along, uh, it's it's interesting that conversations even within people who read the same literature is not possible anymore. There's something happening at that, at, at, at that, at that level, which is, which is radical, that things sort of escape into some form of release of energy. You know, like Freud talked about motor activities as a young child, you remove your hands for release of excess energy before you have language in that sense. It's something of that nature, which, which, which sort of, you know, that there's a pent up energy which has to be immediately released out. It cannot be held in conversations, and and it's actually not only dividing, say, um, say between different theoretical camps, say even between the Tupinamba and Zizek today. Um, 
I I think there are irreconcilable differences emerging in 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 that sense. And you know, recently I was sort of on a, on some Lacanian conference. Uh, you no, know, uh, so the discussion was taking place that that I think Lacanians are not able to articulate themselves within this discussion. Um, you know that 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 at this moment they're not even a player in that in in that 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 that, that choice doesn't exist on the table. You know, to be a Lacanian, you know, when 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 we talk about okay, I I come from gender from the Lacanian lens. I don't think that choice exists on the table right now. The choices are so polarized that I I, I that you know either you're on this side or that side. And Lacanians are, I think themselves are trying to be on the right side of the debate. And I am personally all for the chance. You know, I I think I I think if there's a moment that they can articulate their own freedom. I don't think I I'm somebody will take it away from them in that sense, you know, or even women doing that. I, but I I do not I do not understand that that if we can't even articulate the debate properly, how is there a right side and wrong side possible? I don't know how 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 you how you, how you're navigating that in your own work and in, in your own um, spaces in that sense. <laughs> how far has this this problem reached for you all? <laughs> I I would be interested to <laughs> know from you in that sense. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of go ahead, Dave. I'll just say something short here. Uh, it is, yeah. So you're you're kind of saying like it's so it's so touchy, and it's like how do you even navigate it, right? And I uh, I think it's really interesting that. If you say, for instance, oh, there's rising numbers of people detransitioning. So what, 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 do we, what do we, you know, what, what should we think about that? Like, instead of that being like a rational conversation about like, well, what's the definition of affirmative care? What did it used to be? What is it now? What are some other possibilities for affirmative care? Instead, it's just like, no, it just has a specific definition and we either reject it wholeheartedly uh, wholesale or uh, just we just have to affirm it because the, the there's this fear of of suicide statistics, which are also debated highly, and so it's like that is a landmine because people want to do the right thing for their children, people want to do the right thing for their students, people on both sides are accusing the other of grooming and all these other things you know so it's it's very very polarized and i feel bad for teachers i feel bad for parents um who are caught up in this and are really being made the foot soldiers for a very lucrative uh media uh feeding feeding frenzy like the the civil war is occurring through the media and they're getting rich off of it right the certain fundamental contradictions and also uh experiences are being monopolized by the competing duopoly. Yeah, so when it's a duopoly, it's not a, Chomsky's model is irrelevant. Matt Taibbi's good for this in his Hate Inc. He says that uh, Chomsky's model of manufacturing consent by having both sides basically having this general consensus has, I think there's someone with a mic on right now, has been uh, re replaced by duopolistic media forms where both sides rely on inculcating fear and hate vis-a-vis -vis the other. And it's it's very lucrative. And so when I say monopolize certain kinds of experiences or contradictions, if someone kills your child, uh, let's say a cop kills your son, okay, well, where do you get to go? Obviously, it's going to be MSNBC. Um, and I met a guy who was a former uh, Trump supporter. Uh, Petey Perez was a Latino boy who was murdered by the police in California. His father was a Trump supporter who started getting involved with BLM protests and because he had no other outlet. And then over time, he, you know, he, he had a lot of conflicts with people, but eventually he became a member of the community and he's kind of taken on a lot of the norms. Um, so I think it's PD Press. I think his dad is not, dad's name was Ricky. And so, you know, I, I met them in California at a protest and I was like, that was, uh, that was amazing. The, the, obviously if, if, most therapists do want to do good by their therapeutic subjects, their patients. Now, you also have very naive progressivist types of solutions where a person just, oh, well, they don't want to be responsible for suicide. So it's just pure affirmation all the way. 
And then you have like Chloe, who was just on Jordan Peterson, right? Talking about how uh, she, she saw TikTok. She thought, this is the solution to my problems. I'm in the wrong body. She learned what to say to convince a the therapist. She went, convinced the therapist that she needed to have double mastectomies as quick as possible, got those done at the age of 14 or 15. And now she's like 18 years old and she's crying. She's sobbing her eyes out on, on the Peterson show or whatever. And it's like, and she's like, this, this shouldn't have happened to me. And I'm not sure I'll ever be able to have children. And I didn't want to have children before. Now I do want to have children and I'll never be able to nurse them and all of this stuff. And it's like, that is, that is rightfully touchy because obviously you also have people who need this care and that's not going to be their experience. And it's not, it's not just through TikTok or whatever. So I don't see that going away, but yeah, the, the, the two sides have monopolized um, legitimate grievances and they're, they don't want to have a dialogue, right? They, they're, they're, it's a feeding frenzy for, for what had been a bad business model. You know, the institutions of corporate capture have pretty much fully recaptured places like YouTube that used to be the wild, wild west. Now, if you look up political things, it's almost all CNN. So, yeah, I, it's, it's touchy. And uh, I, 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 took a, I took a stand saying that Slavoj Žižek is not wrong to point to these contradictions in his wokeness is here to stay article. And I caught a lot of flack for that. I also got a lot of support for it. It'd be very easy for me to just lean into that and make all my content about that. And that is what most people do today. They just lean into that and they make all their content about that. I say, I don't wanna have a conversation with you unless you read what is sex with us. <laughs> I don't know if, if Chitang can get away with that at his job, but... Uh... Oh no! I, hey, <laughs> he he doesn't need to. I know he already has a basis in this text. I mean, yeah, he's way yeah, ahead yeah. Of me. He he is my master in this situation. I understand that. All right. So we, we do have we do have two we do have two more hands raised. I'd like to get to them before maybe the top of the hour. So um, Raza and then Michael Downs, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. And I think ending with Michael Downs might be a good way to end this video. So uh, Raza, you first. Welcome Hi. here, Raza. Hey, um, so I just had a maybe naive question about just categorical grounding. Um, I just wanted to know like why why is everything phallically oriented? Like I remember um, hearing Alexander Bard say that um, man has phallus, whereas the woman is phallus. And like just when I'm talking about this sort of stuff in circles that aren't aware of these terms. Um, it, it feels like, th like there is a sort of biological essentialism that plays into that based on just speaking about it with people that have no grounding in it. So is there a way that we can categorize things that are not derived from the phallus, like the, categor the categorical opposite, um, just in terms of the yonic? So is there a way like that you can maybe integrate that in Lacan? Or like if you have the trans position where Zizek says it's the plus, the plus is the trans position for him. Um, is that category also, like is the phallus also there in that category? Or um, yeah, I'm not really sure to frame it, but like wh why, is it, why does it feel like the phallic, everything is phallically oriented? Well, not everything is phallically oriented because there is a feminine jouissance as well. But the, the thing is, is that I think you have to understand that the, the history of this discourse is that the hit like first the history of the discourse was Freud was very influenced by um, biological metaphor. He was trying to explain things in terms of thermodynamic energy, thermodynamic energy dynamics. And then basically what Lacan did was uh, interpret Freud, Freudian theory through structural linguistics. So when Lacan is talking about the phallus, uh, he's he's not talking about, of course, it's derived from the, the, or the organ, but it's basically being expressed as a form of enjoyment in symbolic terms. So he's talking, I mean, he's talking in terms of uh, different forms uh, of, of 
almost enjoying the speaking body. But the, the, the point that the made, the, I'm not sure if it gets at your question, but the major thing here is that with Lacanian theory, the sexual body is being understood through influenced by structural linguistics, structural anthropology, and the met like the phallus is in some sense a metaphor of enjoyment. Um, is the phallus uh, structurally speaking in Lacanian terms? Would it be the one that that is like the illusion of the one that someone has? The logic is the phallus is the logic of the all, and the feminine is the logic of the non-all. So the phallic logic is always the one, uh, the one without exception. And the feminine is the non-all, or it includes the exception. Uh, but would it would it be possible to describe the non-all as um, some other category ra rather than derived from the phallic? I don't know if that makes sense. I think I don't know if anyone else wants to to chime in on this one, but to me, Dave does. So Dave's gonna Dave's gonna chime in. Um, but to if you look at look, the development of Lacan's writing, when it comes to his final work, he's focusing on feminine jouissance. So it's 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 certainly something where in Lacan's thought there's there's uh, say the there is sort of an enjoyment outside or beyond the phallus. Does that make sense, Dave? Do you wanna do you wanna do you wanna jump in here? Yes. Um, so I kind of want to set Mikey up here because he wrote the phallus post and it's on the dangerous maybe blog. So the dangerous maybe, which is an obscure phrase from Nietzsche um, is, is Michael Downs's blog. And the, the phallus post is kind of canon for theory underground. It's one of the most uh, fundamental contributions to the world of online theory that has ever been made. It is used by a lot of Lacanians in academia for their own classes, right? Um, like Todd McGowan and a couple others who maybe, I don't know if Mikey, if you wanna reference them, they will util utilize these. Um, and the that was the one that I referenced earlier. So I just kind of wanted to say, that's really where to go. Now, are there other ways of going about theory? Can we have a different theory? Could we have a better theory? Um, I do think that there's like a case to be made for that, but of course we have to pass through Lacan. And so most people, when they use the idea of phallic, uh, as a sort of adjective, it's just being used as a sort of characterization, as a sort of like braggadocious mode, you know, Trump's phallic behavior, you know, oh, he's so phallic. Um, obviously Biden is not, you know. A, you know, so we got the Chad, we got the cuck, and obviously the Chad is going to be the phallic habit, you know, the, I, but what does it mean to say that Trump has the phallus, right? It means that Melania is standing there making him look good. It's she's standing there, all of his, all of his, his, uh, his apparent coherence and power and symbolic glory is based on her propping him up at being the phallus that he has, right? And so, you know, we live in a lot more complicated times, perhaps. And so there is a case to be made that it get, I don't know. But um, the, yeah, I, I like how Cadell said that it's, it is symbolic. And so obviously, I mean, I like Cardi B is phallic as fuck. All right. She couldn't be phallic without this being a thing, you know, that, that, that exists. And so that, that's, my, that's my basic thing is to say that you can't really do gender queer stuff you you can obviously blur lines but as far as like performing things that are supposedly opposite of your sex um then that would you know it it, it requires like a knowledge of how this functions because what we have today are a lot of influencers like contrapoints in philosophy tube being like oh i'm a woman now because i dress like one and i act like some uh middle class wine mom I act like a diva. <laughs> I act like a diva, so I'm a woman. And it's like, actually, you're still pretty phallic. You act like you're the one who's got it. And the, the one who acts like they've got it is performing 
masculinity to a T and in woke spaces appearing feminine at the level of aesthetics, but functionally, functionally performing the fall, you know, having the phallus mm. symbolically is what's going on in a lot of these cases. And that goes for Natalie and that goes for Abigail. And so I think that's the problem in the left. The problem in the left is that they, because they, because the left can't think masculinity and they can't represent masculinity, the phallic figures have to appear as a woman and then perform phallically, which is a, <laughs> it's a really interesting point. Um, and hopefully the young Zizekian culture can change that because it, I think there is a sort of a, a positive affirmation of the phallus there. Uh, Michael, Michael Downs, you're with us. Uh, can you unmute yourself and? Yeah, I can unmute for a second. I'm still on my route, but I'm taking my lunch break. Um, my, my question is a little bit more simple here. I'm just curious with your reading of what is sex and the time you've spent with Zizek and Lacan, because I, 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 I'm always wrestling with this. Do you make a full identification between libido and jouissance or do you differentiate them? Because this is a, an ongoing question I wrestle with is whether or not libido and jouissance are the same because a lot of the times Lacanians and Zizekians will just use them synonymously. And yet at the same time, Libido is something, it's, it's always presented as a kind of energy we have that we invest in things, right? Whereas jouissance seems to be something that we get from losing, self-sabotaging, death drive, um, et cetera. And so there seems to be conceptual differentiations between the two terms, but there's also oftentimes identification. So I'm just curious about how, how you think about this relation between libido and jouissance. I, I, I see it. So the, the way I usually describe it is in, in the history of Freud's career is in the history of Freud's career, libido is basically, there's not really a concept of jouissance or room for a concept of jouissance or something like jouissance in Freud's early career because he's just focused on libido. It's only when we get to death drive where something like the concept of jouissance can appear. And then the unique thing where Zizek is sort of developing Freudo-Lacanianism is that um, actually there's only one drive and that's the death drive. So in some sense, what Freud is studying at the beginning of his career with just the focus on libido is almost like the entry point into um, discovering this absolute negativity or this death drive where, where, where jouissance operates. So yeah, I do think there's a meaningful distinction between libido and jouissance at the end of the day. Does that does that answer it or does that point in an interesting direction? Yeah, it's to stay. Yeah, that helps. I mean, I guess the question, like, okay, even with the on you know the onset of the discovery of death drive, pleasure principle is still a thing. We we still are oriented towards pleasure, maybe not as much. It, okay, maybe the primary orientation is towards jouissance, but we still have this this dialectic of pleasure and jouissance. It's the, and so it's the, the excess, question, the distortion it, of pleasure. Yeah, but I mean, but there's also a time where jouissance is unbearable and you have to have it evacuated from your body to even be able to continue to function. And so, you know, there is this dialectical relation, like part of the whole thing, like we can only move towards the attainment of jouissance precisely because pleasure principle is operative in a way. And so then it's, you know, because Freud talking about libido long before he discovered death drive, libido is going to be linked to pleasure. And so it gets into this complication, like is libido a name for this dialectic between jouissance and pleasure? Or, you know, it's just, it's one of these ongoing complicated complications because again, if the thing is, if, if libido is sexual energy that we have, that we invest in things, it, there's this distinction. I mean, jouissance is what we get, the, the, the excessive enjoyment we get from not get having you know yeah mcgowan's term is enjoying what we don't have but if libido is a kind of energy we do have that we invest in things it, it just to me there's a there's a conceptual difference here that i'm not sure what to do with yet 
I mean, I think that's a fundamental question that we, we should cont- like should definitely wrestle with throughout the book. And maybe the core part, like to me, the core area of the book, which requires all of our attention on this question is where Alenka in the last chapter of the book focuses on two different concepts of death drive, where the first concept of death drive is basically the Freudian concept where we're you know, like we all want to die or like the, it's basically the desire for death, but then the Lacanian and then the Deleuzian extensions of death drive where it's the, um, basically it's the increase of tension. It's not the desire for death, but increasing, and it's not the reduction of tension, but the increasing tension. And the point where you're saying with jouissance, we need to evacuate jouissance from our body completely. I would say that is an example where we've we've entered sort of the the space of jouissance of increased tension but the tension is so overwhelming that we can't take it anymore and i think that the the sweet spot is where we're navigating a certain tension like it's it's you don't want to get rid of tension completely you also don't want to be so overwhelmed by tension that you die um but that there's some level at which it's it's somehow navigable or maintainable or st- I don't know, metastable. Yes, please. Thanks. That was that was good. Looking forward to seeing how this develops. It's it's a central question. And I again I think this is something that we're gonna have to really go into full with all of our attention in the last chapter of what is sex, because that that's really a genius. That that's really where there's there's something genius at work in Alenka's ideas. But um, okay, so on on that note, Dave, if, if there's anything you want to end with, let's 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 let's. I think we should wrap up here because we've been at this for three hours now. And okay, yeah, uh... I wanna I wanna I wanna go. <laughs> I, I, yeah, we better we better wrap it out. So I'll just say really quick, everyone, that it's been a pleasure, an honor. Um, I've enjoyed it, and I. Uh, you know, if 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 talking is is fucking, then this has been a great orgy, there and. You go. Uh, I, I guess the, you know, Cadell, if you want to take the Cree course, the, uh, which you should, if you are able to, like that is diving in the deep end and you've got no better person to go along, to, to, no more better th- of a swim coach than Cadell and what he's doing at Philosophy Portal. So I highly recommend beginning with Ecre on July 15th, but, um, you know, and what is sex is included in one of the tiers there. Um, at Theory Underground, uh, there's a, a forum for an ongoing conversation about the text for people who take this in the future. And the higher tiers that you can take um, are ones that are just for my, my time and energy, for uh, if you want my critical feedback on your writing in this course, if you want, um, I'll, I'll basically be taking your weekly reflections in your final project and you'll get like the professor treatment, because you know I have my experience from the university, and I'll mark it up and give you really critical and honest feedback that is constructive, and that is exhausting for me. It takes a lot out of me, but it's also rewarding. And so, if that's of value to you, and you want that kind of, uh, then I definitely sign up for it. And then at the higher level, uh, one-on-one d- discussions about these things are also possible. And so. If that's interesting to you, I do that. I know Cadell does similar stuff as well. So definitely check out what he's got to offer. And everyone, thank you so much. It's been great. All right, guys, I'm going to sign off here. Thanks, for, thanks everyone for your time and attention. And uh, as, as Dave said, what is sex starts May 7th. So look out for that and more stuff from both Philosophy Portal and Theory Underground.